Hey everyone, and welcome back for episode three of Andrea Asks. Tonight's gonna be an advocacy special, an update on what's going on federally here in the US and on what's going on in New Jersey specifically. We have four guests lined up for tonight, starting with Chris Goldstein, Kristen Geode of Tricom Analytical. He might be familiar with from back in December, we did a home grow panel here. Um, we also have Jake from UFC, who's a union worker here representing the cannabis union and a medical patient. And we're gonna have Shramuel or Sam back on again from our home grow panel to represent the growers here in New Jersey. It's gonna be a full night and I can't wait to get to our first guest. Chris, you wanna join us now? Hey, thanks so much. It's great to see you. Hey, um, so I know we get to talk pretty frequently because of everything going on here in New Jersey. It doesn't really give us much of a break, but I'd like to make sure everybody in the audience knows who you are. If you've been familiar with any kind of cannabis advocacy on the East Coast, you've probably heard his name pop up. He's been involved in everything from writing laws to reporting on them, organizing them, sleeping on the pavement for them, getting arrested for them, getting pardoned for them. He's He's been pretty active. So currently the regional organizer for Normal. Um, Chris, what are you up to right now? Well, thank you for that. Uh, yes, um, I did sleep on pavement for 60 days. That was Occupy Philadelphia. So, and it was it was okay. It was good. 60 days, well worth effort. People still talk about it today. Uh, it was challenging camping, but it was good camping. Um, what am I up to today? Um, you know, I work on Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And New Jersey has so much going on right now. Um, just today, you see what the legislature is doing. Our, our New Jersey legislature in Trenton is sneaky. They like to do things without too much transparency. We're used to a, a form of government here that doesn't have much sunshine is the diplomatic way of putting it. But um, today they were looking to even have less sunshine. They're passing a bill to uh, essentially gut the Open Public Records Act request. That's tough for journalists like me because I've used OPRA. It's called OPRA, Open Public Records Act. And by getting rid of the Open Public Records Act, journalists, activists, anybody who wants to, you know, take a look at what's going on with government would be cut off. I used OPRA requests back in 2011 to get the original applications for New Jersey's medical marijuana program permits. There were only six permits, 18 applications. And some of the stuff in those applications was really bombshell stuff. Um, when we got them back, they weren't redacted very much, which was cool. And we found out that Chris Christie's friends and political appointees had gotten one permit. Another permit had gone to uh, this group of, I'm seriously like Russian business people. It was totally shady. And without Oprah, we would have never known who got any of these permits. Um, today, they actually redact a lot of them out of the NJCRC application process. So we got more sunshine back in the day on the on the first applications. A lot of those folks are still in business. So it was tough to see New Jersey's government working on Oprah today. Uh, I sent in testimony, you know, written testimony, and I know a lot of other people did, too. I know when it comes to Oprah, we've used it in a lot of different ways on cannabis. I know Lefty with Sativa Cross was mentioning oh, yeah. that he used it to reveal racist practices involved with cannabis arrests where they were actually misdocumenting um, Hispanic and African-American arrests as Caucasian arrests to try and skew the data to make it to hide how bad it actually was. Wow. Personally, I've worked with a couple people to use Oprah to try and track down information on what's happening with institutional access in terms of the Jake Honig um, Compassionate Care Act, because the CRC set up a committee that was supposed to work on implementing this. And we saw meeting minutes for two years. And then as far as we know, even with Oprah, we couldn't find anything more. So it's getting harder and harder to find information. And the hoops they're making us jump through or the information they're taking completely off the table is is pretty scary. It's And it's unique to Trenton, uh, Andrea. I have to say, I, I hope people don't think that it's like this everywhere. It's not. Um, if you look at New York, they have this like really nice government interface to make these kinds of requests. They don't make it seem so onerous. Even in the city of Philadelphia, I found it easier to like do Freedom of Information Type Act requests. 
Pennsylvania, Delaware, not this tough. Trenton is a unique thing for this. Um, we really lack transparency here. It's well known sort of around the country. Um, but that's why they get away with <clears throat> these sort of lame duck measures. They do so much behind closed doors. Earlier this year, there was a lame duck bill that affected cannabis. The lame duck session is when they have a very short session and there are legislators in between. They've been you know, called for election. They're on their way out, some retirements. So lame duck session is where you can get people to say yes to things on their way out the door. So it's a, it's a time that is seen that a lot of bills get passed and they do it happens in just a week or two. So we've been waiting years. I mean, years to get a single committee hearing on home grow. They passed a, a bill to gut the public records act in a day today. I mean, in 24 hours, it got through all the committees, everybody voted. It's, it's like machine politics at its best, but Duck session in January of this year, they pushed through a bill that relaxed the ethics rules for politicians to own cannabis businesses. So they made it easier. Like it used to be unethical, but now they made it a little bit more ethical to do it because New Jersey, we're the most ethical state in the country. I mean, we just changed the rules so that the ethics fit. It's perfect. So I mean, it, yeah, yeah, we pretty much do here. And I know we've been fighting actively, like personally, for home grow since the lame duck session of last of last year, and begging because, you know, patients like me who don't really have access to the medicine we need in New Jersey, we're we're out of options. So our life is on the line. And personally, I have nothing better do to do, or nothing else I can do, than just to try to advocate for my own rights. And it's introduced me to a lot of cool people and we're a lot farther than we were the last time we talked about this type of stuff back in December. Um, having people like you on board who can organize this kind of thing and navigate the craziness that is Trenton, where it seems like a brick wall to new people, mm -hmm. unless you're either involved and you have access to the press or to actual phone numbers, because a lot of times they're not even connected. The voicemails aren't getting answered your emails aren't getting responded to as private citizens. It's it's tough in New Jersey. Can you compare Trenton maybe versus some of the other states that you work in? I know you've been doing a lot of work in Pennsylvania right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, behind me is this uh, PA35 right here and Ben Franklin smoking a joint. Um, PA35, you know, they're still arresting people for marijuana possession in Pennsylvania. Um, we solved this issue in New Jersey largely, mostly. And um, we had a press conference. We'll talk about that later, but uh, about how many arrests we've stopped in New Jersey. But Pennsylvania, it's still going on. I do go out to Harrisburg frequently. I've been working out there and with activists across Pennsylvania for a while. Um, is it different? Yeah, it is. Um, Pennsylvania, If when you go to Harrisburg, you it, Harrisburg is cool. The building itself is sort of like a miniature United States Congress. So you've got the Senate on one side, the House on the other. There are these buildings where people have offices. They're actually there. They have secretaries and a staff and the legislators are there. They're physically there. Um, oh, you're allowed to go have meetings with them? Because here that seems to be the hardest thing. <laughs> well, and yeah, I agree. And, you know, the other thing about Pennsylvania is that you run into them in the hallway and the cafeteria. Like there's there's a lot of like public interaction with the legislators. It doesn't exist like that in Trenton. It wasn't always like this. When I first started doing this like 15 years ago, you'd go down to the cafeteria and you'd see some legislators be like, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up, marijuana activist? Hey, what's up, state senator? That doesn't happen anymore. Um, they, you know, they're redoing the building. COVID happened. And the style of government really changed during the pandemic. Um, I think one of the things that I thought would be cool was during the pandemic, you could do remote testimony. We were talking about this the other day, which... It was so accessible to patients, like for people like you who want to advocate for medicine or any kind of health care issue, asking people to physically travel to Trenton and testify is really not reaching public engagement levels, you know, um, and that's what they do. I, I mean, you can always submit written testimony and it is read into the record, but there is something compelling to being there to talk with legislators and have an exchange. So. I thought that they would extend that. The fact that they stopped doing remote testimony, I'm like, it was one of the best things that really ever happened. I thought it it really opened up 
more people participated, more people were talking about government, more people were excited. It was really a good thing. It really was. Um, and I think, I think even if the CRC were to open up remote testimony, it would be a sign of good faith um, yeah. because they're supposed to regulate the medical program. They're supposed to understand how important like some of these issues are specifically. So it is something patients like me are asking for. And I'm sure we'll cover our issues with the CRC later tonight. Um, <laughs> but in Pennsylvania, you're saying nowadays you can actually go in and they're willing to talk to you. But I know Pennsylvania wasn't always that easy and they're still doing possession arrests. So I'm sure it's not all all buddy buddy. No, um, it's it's not easy over there in the in the fact that the law hasn't changed. And it Pennsylvania is a weird sort of example of the whole country. It's not a red state. It's not a blue state. It's a real mix right now. And we have a lot of politicians who are taking extreme positions on the issue. Nonetheless, um, I think that the writing's on the wall over there. I think Pennsylvania is like so many states right now. But in a year that it's an election year, having 12,000 people get arrested for marijuana, we're also bringing the World Cup in. Not, the World Cup's not just coming to New Jersey, but they're going to do some games in Philly and everything too. Arresting people for weed is like the most anti-tourist thing that you can do in 2024. It's just like not cool. So I'm just trying to get this message across over there, Pennsylvania. But when it comes to, you know, actually doing citizen lobbying, the legislators, although they haven't passed the law, are more friendly and affable, I would say, on the whole and more accessible. In Delaware, it's really interesting if you ever get a chance to go to Delaware compared to New Jersey or Pennsylvania. The Delaware legislature is extremely small. It's the second smallest governing body in America, Alaska, Delaware. Alaska has 61 members in its entire legislature. Delaware has 62. And um, so it's like a giant city council. Everybody really knows each other down there. Um, and nothing, you know, the marijuana issue turned out to be quite contentious. The governor of Delaware, Jack Carney, was the only Democratic governor in America to ever veto a marijuana legalization bill. And I sat there and listened to lobbyists from Columbia Care take their well-paid time to show up and testify against full legalization. I mean, we had Columbia Care lobbyists. I had to write about this in a blog for Normal at the time. Uh, Columbia Care lobbyists and lobbyists for some big MSO said, if, if we don't get a grandfather in, this is going to put us out of business. And I was just like, how do they like, can they, how do they say that with a straight face? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I know in New Jersey, we've had problems with MSOs from the start, like you were saying, especially with the initial, initial licenses even. And since then we were promised we would have certain independent cultivators and medical providers first to the market. And it was MSOs a lot of times that had their doors open first and um, citizens who are really trying to work from the legacy to legal pipeline that are still stuck struggling in that pipeline if they're if they haven't opted out of it by now at all because a lot of the conditional licenses weren't converting. Hmm. Um, hmm. We're in a we're in a bit of a tricky place in New Jersey, but at least we have our possession rights. At least we do have a recreational industry. But hmm. unlike Pennsylvania, we don't have medical home grow. Um, Pennsylvania. Oh, Pennsylvania, no medical. There's no home grow in Pennsylvania. No mm -hmm. medical home grow. No adult. No, there is no home grow in Pennsylvania or Delaware, I might add. So, oh. yeah, Pennsylvania, um, New Jersey set a bad example in the region with our home grow provisions. Um, and um, Delaware and Pennsylvania, Delaware is another state that legalized adult use and medical cannabis. And along with New Jersey still has no home cultivation. So this is not a good idea. Um, we have set a bad regional example. So I think that when we fix home grow here in the garden state, it might set about a better example in Pennsylvania and Delaware too. I think that um, New York finally getting their recreational home grow should hopefully help push to us to at least get medical home grow. We're usually, oh, we're usually a step behind New York. We wait into, we wait to see what happens in the States around us and then try to copy their legislature. I mean, We'll get into it later, but even our testing limits and testing, mm -hmm. all of our testing regulations are pulled from Maryland still, mm -hmm. except for the batch limit, which we changed temporarily years ago and is an ongoing problem. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of things there, though. I mean, I and I think it's important not to not to go too far there because New Jersey. It's funny, Andrea. Like every state that passes legalization, you'll hear the legislators come out and say, "This is the best law in the entire country. This is the absolute most scientific." best, amazing, super perfect marijuana law ever. And Senator Scataria, I'll never forget him saying stuff like that about the medical law. He said stuff like that about the recreational law. The Pennsylvania legislator said it. The Delaware legislator said it. I mean, I, I think it's funny. The whole country is full of the best marijuana laws ever, but none of them seem to be delivering equity, have fair prices for patients, or are really delivering on all the promises that were made at the time they were passed. So they're the best, but none of them have worked. It's funny. And unfortunately, a lot of times they're not actually scientifically based, no matter how much the legislators want to preach they are, because, I mean, we see firsthand in New Jersey, a lot of times the, the scientists are ignored just as much as the patients are in terms of having our voice in legislature, our voice in terms of like regulations by the CRC. It's it's come a long way though, and we should be grateful because I know I know it was just over 10 years now that you were arrested and it's you now actually have a federal pardon for that. So as much as we want to complain that things aren't where they need to be, we gotta recognize still where they came from. Um, do you want to tell people a little bit about how you actually earned both of those? Uh, you're right, though. I mean, we we shouldn't forget that things have changed really for the better. And, you know, we have a whole new generation now that have grown up in a world with legal cannabis, either medical cannabis or adult use cannabis. When I started doing this back in the Bush administration... <laughs> You know, it it was pretty, you know, even New Jersey, just three years ago, right up until the very moment that Governor Murphy signed the laws, we were arresting 100 people a day. But I had to, you know, I lived with a lot of privilege in my life. I smoked marijuana from the time I was a teenager, and I never got arrested for it until I protested against federal prohibition. So I, I went out to Independence Hall National Historic Park with a group of us. And we said that we would go out once a month at 420 and light joints. And we weren't trying to like go inside any of the buildings. There's a, a monument to the First Amendment that's outside. And they've made this outdoor area. It's far away from any building. It's like in the park area. And it's called a free speech zone there. You're supposed to come and demonstrate. So we demonstrated by smoking marijuana. And the first couple of months, it was great. Nobody was arrested. Nobody was cited. We went out. And on, on 420, 2013, we had about a thousand people show up and light joints. And it was it was really a great time. Uh, in May, when we came back <laughs> for our monthly protest in May, um, the National Park Service Rangers and the Federal Protective Services, it was like the Empire Strikes Back. They they came out with like hundreds, I'm serious, hundreds of armed tactically armed law enforcement, uh, the National Park Rangers. I didn't know they had riot gear, but they have riot gear. They have they have green National Park Ranger riot gear, I guess, for like Buffalo riots, stuff like that. And they had their riot gear on and they came in and the U.S. attorney, the federal prosecutor, set up a tent and processed us right there. And so they came in and really roughly handled a lot of us for smoking joints. Um, so I got cited twice. Uh, one time was um, uh, you pay a $170 ticket. So I paid it. And we went back and did another monthly protest. And I got cited again. And when they took me over to the tent, the US attorney checked a little box on my ticket that said uh, remanded to court. So then they took me to trial uh, over a half a gram of marijuana. It took about six months. And 10 years ago this month, actually, it's it's it really is kind of amazing how time flies. But 10 years ago this month, I stood before a federal judge in Philly and he sentenced me for a half a gram of marijuana to a three thousand dollar cash fine 
24 months of supervised probation and it was very supervised. They drug tested me dozens of times and um, a permanent criminal record. And the judge I was pretty scary. The judge said to me in court that day, uh, Mr. Goldstein, um, I strongly considered putting you in prison for 30 days. And if you violate your probation, I won't hesitate you to hesitate to throw you in prison for 30 days for every violation. Um, so uh, and then my attorney, who was really a friend of mine and a really wonderful man, uh, he passed away in the middle of my probation. We were filing appeals, but uh, he had had uh, open heart surgery and he passed away. And so I was without my my amazing attorney. And so I ended up having to serve every single day of my probation and uh, did not have a chance to appeal the case. So the only recourse was getting a presidential pardon. Um, I didn't want to do it. You could have got I could have applied for it individually starting in 2018. But um, I and other activists worked on some sort of form of broad clemency. And what's crazy is that in 2022, President Biden, out of the blue, in October of 2022, made this announcement on marijuana policy. Uh, it was kind of like completely out of the blue. And um, it was uh, seen by many as sort of an October surprise to that a midterm election. But um, it was also very well timed for this two years later. In October of 2022, uh, President Biden historically issued an executive order. He pardoned people like me who had a federal marijuana possession charge. And then he sent a letter uh, to the Health and Human Services Secretary ordering a review of scheduling in of marijuana in the CSA for everybody to explore that. But yeah, I got a pardon. And uh, so the pardon was issued by the president. It, it's act, technically it's the pardon is enacted when the president speaks it. It's like an old school. But um, when you tell people you have a presidential pardon, they do kind of ask for proof. And um, so they have a certificate system where you get a certificate for this, but they didn't have the application available until March of 2023. And then President Biden in December of 2023, just around Christmas, announced an expanded, expanded proclamation of the pardons, which extra covered everything. And then suddenly in January, I got an email from the U.S. pardon attorney with my pardon. And I was like, I just like out of the blue one day, I opened my email and it said Department of Justice, U.S. pardon attorney. And you're like, you know, you see the Department of Justice part and you're like, oh, geez, you know. And um, but um, then you see U.S. pardon attorney. You're like, OK, it's that part. It's the, the only cool part of the DOJ is the pardon attorney. So um, and I actually got to meet her. So uh, the certificate arrives in the in the mail and now you have a proof. So back to your question about expungement and President Biden did all those things in October and December, and they've gotten all the executive actions so right. But every time they talk about marijuana, they get it a little bit wrong. <laughs> so during the State of the Union this week or last week, President Biden said expungements that and it's just it's like not quite there. So, yeah. Wait, you're on mute. Yep, yeah, there you go. Because you may have a pardon, but you still have a record. And even though it was during a protest and for the tiniest amount and as above board and documented as you could be that you weren't busy being a hooligan or a criminal. Um, do you want to talk about how that's affected you over the years and the, some of the things that the pardon might not necessarily fix innately? or that it can't give back besides the time or the stress of going through that whole process or the money involved? Yeah, I won't get the $3,000 back, that's for sure. And um, uh, getting drug tested in your house and having a federal probation officer come to your house is um, not fun. And I don't wish it upon anybody. Um, and um, I had to get permission to leave New Jersey every time I left New Jersey. At the time, I worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer and Temple University. So that was like three or four days a week. And that seemed extreme. Um, but they they kept that up for the entire two years. Is um, that the, while you were writing the class on, at Temple? Yeah. I mean, I was, I, I again, I was, I was teaching at Temple and um, um, I had all these things going on in Philly. Yeah. So what's that? 
but didn't you actually add a marijuana class to the curriculum at Temple? At I did. Point? I did at the journalism department. Yes, I, I <laughs> added the marijuana and the news class to the curriculum at the journalism department. And again, I had to get permission every day to go. Or every time I had to go teach the class, I had to get permission to go over, which was kind of crazy. Um, but then uh, the other thing was the permanent record. Um, I have to say that um, that came up in weird ways. Um, teaching I didn't just teach at Temple. I applied to be an adjunct at Rutgers and other universities. And the process was more difficult than I imagined. And the record was a little bit a part of that. Um, as a parent, there's a lot of things where your criminal background check comes into play too, um, you know, for sports, for softball. And it, there's probably good reasons for this stuff. But when it comes to the marijuana record, you don't want it to get into the way of parenting either. And uh, I guess finally, you know, I... I travel overseas and when you have a federal marijuana record and you're sitting in the customs office in like Panama or Costa Rica, there is a sinking feeling that you could be deported like right there for that half a gram of weed like 10 years ago. So uh, once I got the pardon, I was I was strongly considering having it printed on like a T-shirt so that the next time I'm in like the Panamanian customs office, if it comes up on my record, just look at the T-shirt, be all set to go there. So what do you hope to see change? Because I know they can't undo the past, but we're at kind of an interesting point in time. So what do you hope to see change federally in descheduling, rescheduling, wider pardons, expungements, commutations? Yeah, I, I, we would like all those things. Um, that's that's a good list of the ways to start, honestly. Um, keep in mind this White House, we've asked every White House since Nixon to do exactly what the Biden White House has just done. Um, we've asked, I mean, we asked, we thought the Carter administration might do this in the seventies. Didn't happen. We kind of thought the Obama administration was maybe going to do this at the end. Didn't happen there either. So we have asked every administration to do this. The Biden Harris administration have done it. What could happen next? Um, well, right now the, the white house has ordered the scheduling review, which is good. And the HHS, the Health and Human Services Department, have recommended Schedule 3. That's problematic. So Schedule 3 is where ketamine and anabolic steroids and uh, codeine are currently. It's, it's where prescription drugs are. I don't drink a ketamine smoothie in the morning. I don't sprinkle some craft-grown codeine on top. I'm not at my anabolic steroid cafe hanging out at the end of the day. Um, there is no such thing as a Schedule Three over-the-counter state-regulated drug market. So the idea that we would move marijuana to Schedule Three and it would benefit our state systems would would be false. A move from Schedule One to Schedule Three would be tangibly inconsequential to state cannabis regulations, and could perhaps be even more problematic quite honestly. Right now, we have a whole regime where the states have carefully crafted laws that ignore Schedule 1 and the CSA. Schedule 3 just isn't that much different. So I do see, if they go to Schedule 3, not being much change. There's a lot of talk. I think that there's a lot of fantasy talk, and I'm being diplomatic here, um, about how Schedule 3 could benefit large companies and all these things. I just don't see the reality in it. I don't see the tax benefits of Schedule 3. I don't see the business benefits of it. I see more of the status quo. In fact, the worst part about Schedule 3, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California really articulated this best. And she just said it would be 50 more years of prohibition. And I, I agree with her. Um, Schedule 3 is a status quo extension. What's interesting, though, if you read into the HHS documents, which were leaked, and you read through all the stuff that they say, they make a better case for descheduling than rescheduling, which is interesting. So HHS acknowledges that moving to Schedule 3 would solve none of the conflicts with state and federal law. None. Zero. So they're not even, they're not even going to say that out loud. They've recommended Schedule 3, and they punted it to the DEA. The DEA has final authority. They have the ability to describe, schedule, 
and reschedule drugs at will. And the idea here is like if I guess you could think in terms of like K2 and spice and stuff like that, when you have these uh, new emergent synthetic drugs, the DEA can describe them quickly and throw them into a schedule like that. When it comes to marijuana, they have gone through schedule reviews over the last few decades, but they have never agreed with ever moving it out of schedule one. So right now, the question is, what will the DEA do? That's the $10 trillion question. Um, they have, I think a lot of people perceive the question as binary, that either marijuana will stay in schedule one and they will defend that, or they will move it to schedule three. But maybe folks might consider that the states have already addressed this question in a really not cool way. Let's just look at New Jersey. New yeah. Jersey is using what I call dual scheduling. This is a quantum leap. So you're going to have to come with me into like Neil deGrasse Tyson land of billions of stars, except we're going to apply that kind of quantum stuff to marijuana law. And that's what New Jersey is doing. We have. I know what you're going to say. The, yes, the duality yes. of the word. Yes. Um, the, and that's really dangerous on a federal level. Um, and I've seen people here in the chat mentioning it throughout the night because of your word choice so for everybody that's complained that he's called it marijuana pay attention right now because this is why this is the problem one of the problems in new jersey okay so marijuana and cannabis are the same plant but they are described differently under the law this is the quantum leap that we've made in new jersey the same plant simultaneously exists in different galaxies of the law, like a like an, an entangled particle. Marijuana is unregulated and is still in Schedule One of New Jersey's CSA, while cannabis products have a separate legal definition. So you have marijuana and cannabis. And they're right there. They're happening at the same time. Same plant, different legal definitions. But now you have dual scheduling. Now, the DEA so, could look at that example. But to make it really simple for everybody else. Yes. The only cannabis that's legal in New Jersey is tracked from seed to sale through the oh. dispensary process. Everything else is marijuana. Even if it was bought at a dispensary and then you sold it to a friend, that's marijuana. If you gifted it under an ounce, that's cannabis still. There's all kinds of crazy things. Every single plant is marijuana and unless it's under THC percentages where it doesn't count as anything or might fall under hemp. But if it's hemp, it's a different fine. So it is regulated right there. every single way. He's not spewing political jargon at you. It is absolutely a mess in New Jersey, and it's one of the reasons is so they don't have to go back and change a lot of the laws that already address marijuana. So they do have potential to do this on the federal scale is what you're saying, though, right? It would be I, I did not like it when we did this in New Jersey. Um, I argued against this. Um, I thought it was a bad idea. I definitely did not want dual scheduling. I think it's a terrible example at a set for the feds too. So in New Jersey, again, you're right. I mean, you just about nailed it. it. It's so hard to wrap your head around, like what's called what? How do you test it? Again, what is the science being applied here? Who's applying the science? People without any degrees. So we, it's, it's a layered problem for sure. Um, but the basic legal definitions and the scheduling scheme, back to the, what the DEA could do and how the states have done it, it's not just New Jersey. This is Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, all are employed in dual scheduling right now. And you're right, it's easy. 
So why did states why did states leave marijuana in schedule 1? Why would they bother doing that? Why didn't they deschedule or reschedule? Well, okay. Reason number 1, it's easy. It's easy because schedule 1 jibes with uh, schedule 1 of the federal government. It jibes with all these little sections that are written into the law. It's very easy. And here's another reason it's easy. The cops like it. The cops like it because it creates an enforcement regime for unregulated products. So devil's lettuce, marijuana, unregulated products, awesome corporate controlled cannabis, regulated products. That's how they say it. So basically that they've created these legal definitions without doing anything with the old prohibition laws. They just leave that enforcement regime in place for any unlicensed operators or unlicensed products. I do not like this scheme. How would it look federally? Wow. Well, marijuana would stay in Schedule 1, and then the DEA would make something, I don't know, let's just say, quote unquote, medical cannabis appear in Schedule 3. Of course, the only legal medical cannabis in Schedule 3 would be produced by federal operators under a Schedule 3 drug permit. So even that wouldn't cover anything when it comes to state laws or the state operators. So if DEA wanted to be jerks, which they kind of are usually, they might choose dual, dual scheduling like the states did, really to throw an extra wrench in it. Now, that was a long description, but ultimately the White House, no matter what the DEA says, the White House always has the option to deschedule cannabis with one more letter. All the White House has to do is send one more letter to the Health and Human Service Secretary and the DEA, very clearly directing descheduling. It's that easy. Um, and I think it's interesting the process that we're in right now because the, the White House has gone through this rescheduling review. It could be really seen as due diligence. I mean, HHS has made the recommendation, DEA will get a chance to weigh in. But at that point, the White House could say, okay, this is getting really complicated. Schedule three doesn't look like it's going to solve anything. We'd rather deschedule cannabis. And I, I, I mean, I really think that this is, it's, it's not only like descheduling isn't just, it, it's what I got arrested for. We were out there protesting saying, deschedule cannabis. That's why I got arrested 10 years ago. Um, it is the definitive end of marijuana prohibition. Um, it is the only, it's, it's really the only definitive end. Um, descheduling means that marijuana comes out of the CSA. It goes next to alcohol and tobacco, which were never put in the CSA to begin with. But descheduling is the definitive end. And more than the definitive end of marijuana prohibition, it does bring up the whole concept of drug scheduling, it really does make you question. And I, that's why I don't think dual scheduling or schedule three, it doesn't get us there. It extends prohibition forward. And it I certainly is not. I mean, when I was protesting for this 10 years ago, this was like a nerdy, wonky, whoever heard of descheduling. Today, we've got senators sending letters. Everybody out here in the community knows the nuances between descheduling and rescheduling right now. The country is behind descheduling. The White House has a chance to do it. It's like everything's aligning for this awesome moment for marijuana. Like it just it feels like it's all happening. It's very cool. So, um, you know, we've never we have not had an administration in the White House willing to play ball like this. And it will take a White House to end marijuana prohibition. It's that's that's sort of the part about it. Congress has had 54 years. If Congress was going to do something about this, and I, I have to point out that only 27 bills passed in Congress last year. Paul Armentano at Normal reminded me of that today. He was like, Chris, he's like, what, what chance does cannabis have when we're only passing 27 bills in Congress every year anyway? Nothing's getting passed right now. It's it's difficult. So it's, it's the same thing in New Jersey where we can't get any kind of informational hearing on home grow right now. But I I want us to push for a stop order by Governor Murphy. The same I way three years ago, they were able to call for a stop order on possession arrest. I I really think we should move for a stop order on home grow arrests. 
you know, do justice by the people while the legislation catches up. Um, I agree with you. I, I, and that was your idea, Andrea, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I think that the <laughs> Attorney General of New Jersey should stop or should stop all prosecutions for anybody who's caught cultivating cannabis. You know, you and other activists have asked me because I've looked at the possession arrest for years. What who's getting arrested for cultivation? That is really hard to find out. They lump these together with manufacturing and other more serious charges. So it's really difficult to tease out people who are getting arrested just for cultivation. We hear about some cases when people make them public and they ask for our help, like as activists. But getting like the hard data on that is very difficult. I will say the county narcotics task forces have been out there busting people and looking at, you know, busting people for essentially small gardens. So that's what's been going on, too. Oh, you're on mute again. It's still five years per plant, even if you're a patient in New Jersey. Yes. So the the penalties here are strict and, you know, pardons aren't expungements. We're working on certain expungements here in New Jersey, but we need to really broaden a lot of programs. And, you know, I think I think we can actually, you mentioned not having the scientific opinion on certain things before or not being able to back it up, but we do have Kristen Geode from Trichome Analytical here that we can bring on to actually give the scientific opinion on maybe some Oprah and what her take on federal federal descheduling is or any of the things going on right now. Because she was actually involved too with our press conference relating to um, Governor Murphy's stop order three years ago. Yeah, hey, how's it going? Welcome back. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, I was just listening to you guys talk a little bit about the descheduling, rescheduling, and um, really, I mean, what matters for social justice and doing what's right is to deschedule, not reschedule. Rescheduling has a ton of issues. As far as like the safety and laboratory testing side goes, I mean, I guess descheduling would help people access the testing that they would um, maybe want, um, regardless of the the source that they're getting the cannabis, but in general, I think this is more of a social justice issue where um, uh, descheduling is really the only um, the only direction that we should be pushing in and that we should hold them to. So as they said, you know, another if they reschedule, it's going to take another like fifty years before they even touch it or look at it. So let's get, let's ask for what we need, uh, which is descheduling. Yeah, I don't think Congress is ever going to deliver that. Um, I think it's going to have to come from a White House. So this White House is 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 playing ball with the scheduling review. So I, and also, too, it's important to keep in mind, Vice President Harris, when she was a senator, was the lead sponsor of the MORE Act. And the MORE Act deschedules cannabis. So, again, if, if the White House could deschedule cannabis, Congress could do the rest. Um, that's, that's the thing. It, there needs to be this sort of... Uh, you know, pull the, the rock out from the big wheel and get it rolling here. And, and the descheduling, that's that's the definitive executive action. That's that's the push to the big wheel for Congress. And I think once we get that, once we get it kicked off, we'll actually be able to get a lot of movement. And I know federally we're doing a day of unity in D.C. that's calling for certain actions, but hopefully... Hopefully the White House will speak up too, and it won't just be the way it feels here in New Jersey, where even when we're outside the state house, no one's really responding. I, you know, again, don't get, don't get, don't think that New Jersey, it's like New Jersey everywhere. Uh, I have to say that even our own Andy Kim, our, my congressman, he recently co-sponsored the MORE Act. And I would say that like our congressional delegation is more responsive than the state legislators a lot of the time. So um, again, don't get daunted. I think a lot of people get involved with civics and politics for the first time through cannabis. And being a grassroots activist this long, the good thing about that, I have friends who work on, I think, much harder issues sometimes. Homelessness, um, we're talking clean oceans, clean water. They don't get the kind of victories that we do in cannabis, you know? And I have to say that we have to recognize the victories where we get them. But um, like Kristen is saying too, we have to ask for what we really need here. And I think at this moment, even though we've heard back about the scheduling review in Schedule 3, 
I think that this White House, uh, any White House could do it, but this White House is in a, in, a, in a strategic position to do it. I think if we ask for descheduling, I, I think that's the way to go. I think descheduling is the only answer that makes sense too, because cannabis doesn't carry the same risks as a lot of the schedule three substances. Hmm. And we should be able to have access to our medicine. We, we're not restricted to only look at the research within our own country either. Hmm. While we might not have studies being done here because we've been under years of prohibition, there are other countries that are a lot farther ahead than us in terms of the research. Um, while New Jersey only has a handful of links and about, I think it was like 55% of them even work as terms of like resources for the CRC and for like health articles and stuff. Canada has pages and pages of recommendations for medical professionals and for people to like look at dosage guidelines. That's not the only country. There's a a lot of places farther ahead. Germany's legislation recently was pretty interesting. I don't know if I'm sure both of you saw that um, where they don't they're not going to have a commercial market, but there is going to be home grow and social clubs. Yeah, so I think they have two phases um, and this first phase won't include any of the um, like commercial businesses. They already have a medical program with commercial businesses. Um, the phase one is just for the social uh, club structure, which is just like nonprofits um, and members clubs. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, home cultivation is also included. I think each person can have up to three plants, two or three plants in their household. And then you're allowed up to, um, you could form a social club up to 500 members and then grow to provide for all of those members, which I think is really interesting. Um, but maybe uh, too socialist for America. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I like that social club concept and, mm -hmm. and it really goes to the community garden and with what you guys are doing with uh, open lab testing and things like that. You know, this really is the future where where home growers get to see everything scientifically about the plant that industrial growers do. So that's the that's the big difference today. I think, you know, even five or six years ago, we weren't at that point where I mean, People could always grow at home and have their own garden. But the difference now today in 2024 is a lab like yours where home growers get to see everything in the plant. Um, all the same science that happens on the industrial product can happen on your home product. Right, exactly. And uh, in New Jersey, that was so limited up until um, the final approval of NJAC 1730. I mean, the closest next state to go to was like Massachusetts just two years ago for, mm -hmm. for testing. And not a lot of people are um, like educated or aware that they can get their product tested. And um, I think that's extremely important. Uh, there's definitely products I don't think that have ever been tested by any any cannabis laboratory just because they've never made it to the commercial market. And uh, people just, you know, aren't aren't testing uh, their home product. And it's it's interesting to see the different um, like cannabinoid terpene profiles. And um, I think it it helps. It, it's very interesting to me how um, that changes through like cultivation cycle and through different nutrients and, and things like that. Hmm. I know for me as a patient, it was a big deal when you when I found out you could finally get your own ind independent samples tested, whether it's home grow or medicine that you bought in a dispensary that you're having a reaction to, you can actually document these things. Or for someone like me who is working with CBD and working with just different terpenes because the terpenes matter to find labs that actually had certain terpenes on their panels because felandrine is specifically one of the terpenes I look for, but not a lot of labs actually test for it because it's not one of the immediately required um, terpenes. I think a lot of times there's a difference between what's required and what's actually suitable for patients. And I think, I think until we have a lot better accessibility federally and on the state levels, that the only way to provide for patients is to let them handle it themselves. And if they have testing, I know I'm not going to test a hundred pound batch size if I was growing my own. There's no way. Um, it'd be, be pretty much impossible. 
um, but that's the current standard here in New Jersey. Do you see a difference in the risk of testing home grow versus testing larger batches? Well, certainly testing smaller batches, uh, you get a more accurate representation of your entire batch versus like, you know, if you're testing 100 pounds and to run an actual like yeast and mold test, we're only using a gram out of that. Um, it's just not very representative and it's difficult to obtain that representative sample. So it's always better to, you know, work with smaller batches for that, especially if you're concerned of any contaminants that could be within that batch, you would want obviously a more representative sample. It's the same with dosing though too. I mean, cannabis in general um, uh, has, um, it's, it's variable bud to bud slightly. Um, I mean, you'll have the same basic uh, ratios between cannabinoids and terpenes, but the potency can vary. Um, so by having smaller batches, you are more able to um, get a representative sample for testing uh, versus like a larger batch. Because cannabis isn't necessarily consistent all the way through. Testing a hundred pound batch is pretty much testing my body weight. And when we only consume, you know, less than 16 grams in the current testing protocol here, or um, so this is consumed. Generally we have to take, so under the New Jersey regulations, we have to take 0.5% of the entire harvest batch. So if it is a hundred pounds, we're end up taking like 223 grams. Now, what is actually used for testing? Like if we, if you look at, um, AOAC has some pu published methods. So they're like a method uh, uh, chemical method organization that um, tries to, you know, uh, uh, normalize methods uh, in certain industries, including cannabis. Um, I believe their subsample mass is like 500 milligrams, so half a gram. Uh, so out of that 220, 23 grams, like half a gram is going for your potency analysis. I mean, we do our best to homogenize everything. We basically grind it to a fine powder and then um, take uh, representative portions from that entire 223 grams but you know still half a gram out of that it's very low in other states because chris you work in a lot of other states too that's not a standard batch size i know for us it was a temporary change it started at the maryland regulations of 10 pounds and that seems to be pretty average pa is a little bit higher but what do you think about batch size around the states around the country well, I and what's funny was PA, um, Pennsylvania passed their law in 2016. And keep in mind, for the longest time, New Jersey only had one laboratory testing all the medical cannabis. And it was like the state police forensic laboratory, I believe, at Rutgers University. Was, so No, it was the state DOH lab. Um, oh, the DOH lab. lab. So, yeah, they did the, is the PHEL uh, lab. So ah. basically, like, they, they only, like, turned over their instrumentation, like, once a month, once every other month to run all of their samples um, because they, you know, would test other things um, like, you know, PFOS and lead and other um, environmental contaminants. Wow. Well, it, so and and so Pennsylvania opened four laboratories initially, and this was seen as like, oh, great, we'll have four independent labs and that will be a real check on the system. But as Kristen's noted, and I've, I've heard you talk about laboratory shopping before, that was rampant at the beginning of the program. I talked with one of the laboratory owners early on. He was like, I tried, Chris. I tried to be honest. I gave them the test. They just went somewhere else and the product went out. And that's how the program worked. And as much as we complained about laboratory shopping, there wasn't a specific area of the statute that prevented it. And I know that we've done better about preventing laboratory shopping here in New Jersey per se. But the problem is you're one of the first independent, you're the only independent laboratory out there right now. And how many, like how, how many of you will we need to have a safety factor in the market? Will we need one of you in every town? Do we need an independent lab for, you know, every region? How, how many, how much safety do we need here? Well, so it really depends on the uh, the testing regulations. Right now, if we're only testing one sample for every 100 pounds, there aren't that many samples to go around and support multiple laboratories. Right. There are six licensed laboratories in the state, um, so five others uh, besides us. We were the first uh, licensed testing laboratory in New Jersey, but there are five others. We still remain the only, you know, sort of, um, I guess, 
uh, not multi-state operating uh, laboratory, so we're the only like New Jersey startup lab. Um, but there are five other laboratories that are licensed and able to process those samples. As for your question of like how much the industry can support um, or how much laboratories can are needed to support the industry, um, it really depends on batch size. It depends on how quickly these manufacturers and cultivators can get online and how many samples there are to go around and um, the ability for the state to enforce regulations upon those testing laboratories. So I would say that it is critical to have one laboratory that is um, a reference laboratory in the state, whether that's the New Jersey POH lab that was already operating in the cannabis industry before and have since stopped operating uh, in, the, in the cannabis industry, or a, another laboratory that is set up under the CRC to verify the results that are, that are coming out of multiple laboratories and set up round robin testing, so inter-laboratory comparison studies to do secret shopper programs, test off the shelf, to make sure that not only um, are laboratories providing accurate data, but that um, there's nothing happening to that sample after the laboratory tests it that would influence the product on, on the shelf. Hmm. So so are, are you the only open lab to the other laboratories? You seem to be an open lab. You'll take samples, you know, um, and, and test them. Basically, if I brought you a sample from anywhere, I could have it tested there. Are you the only open lab or are the, are the other five independents also open to? Um, I am not sure on the exact status of every one of those five. I know that there are at least three processing samples um, within the state. Uh, I don't know if they're processing samples for individuals, um, but that is allowed under NJAC 1730 for uh, personal use testing. That's cool. And the secret shopper thing, like a nonprofit could yeah. do that with a partnership with you. So it's not a something the state could do, but a nonprofit come in and do it, that, right? It doesn't even require a nonprofit. It requires a group of individuals who are determined and doc willing to document everything. As long as we're willing to pay for things, we can test and compare things compared to what they actually have results on the dispensary shelves. And I think a secret shopper program, whether implemented by the CRC or whether implemented by citizens or a nonprofit is worth working towards. And I think it's a good system of checks and balances between the labs, between storage conditions, because it would help balance out the industry. Right now we have very limited testing, quite honestly, it's only really tested in its final form or unless it's being wholesaled to a manufacturer. Um, we don't, we don't do a lot of secret shopper testing. We don't pull a lot of products off the shelf and retest them. You know, not a lot of people are aware they even have the right to be able to test their own medicines, whether it's a gift, home grow, dispensary bought. I think secret shopper programs are a fair way to keep everybody accountable and as long as people are doing what they can there's nothing to be nothing to be really concerned about there there needs to be more transparency and accountability across the industry and i think the way we do that is getting more scientific advisors involved having more transparency and like the price caps is an interesting approach to it um to taking accountability well that you know, it's, you know, you talk about science and I, 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 so I wonder when the medical marijuana program was at the Department of Health, there were a few people with a science degree over there, I assume, as opposed mm -hmm. to now at the CRC. I mean, this is an agency that was set up for the business side of things. Kristen, you pointed out that there's nobody there to really talk science with you or the other laboratory operators at this point. Um, was it better to have it at the Department of Health, maybe, from a science standpoint? I think that there's an opportunity for the PAPL labs to work with the CRC uh, to fill that void uh, currently in, in the CRC and, and, the, um, and to help uh, with the laboratory like audits and governance. Um, I think mm. that is definitely an opportunity um, mm. that I would encourage both of those parties to explore. Yeah, I wonder if that'll get us back to science. I mean, I, I think that at least the Department of Health, there were people there who could talk on that level, you know, and they were familiar with that end of things. So 
Maybe. Uh, yeah. So when you say uh, the, tell me, uh, I'm not familiar with the acronym that you're saying, PACL Lab. What does that uh, stand for? PACL, um, the Public Health Envir and Environmental Laboratories. Copy that. Okay. Yeah, that sounds really, you know, that is all really interesting. And I definitely learned something right there, especially that acronym definition. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. And, and again, to, to the secret chopper point, I think it's an educational opportunity, not just for figuring out what's in the product on the shelves, but as the CRC goes through and experiences the program as a customer, um, they can they can be uh, observing more than just uh, you know picking a sample up, but you know the medical access and all of that that um, multiple people I know have spoken on within the CRC public comments um, section. Uh, they they should experience all of that firsthand and be able to evaluate the, their own programs through this through a secret chopper program, even if it's not ending up in testing. Like that's just one hmm. one part of this whole program that I think would be beneficial for the CRC uh, themselves as well. I think it would also serve the CRC well to do more patient engagement, but I think the lack of scientific understanding and the lack of scientific backgrounds is also the problem we're running into with the legislature, with the assembly and the mm -hmm. Senate, because unfortunately not a lot of them have backgrounds in science either. So when we're arguing for pheno hunting and things, they're, they're pretty out of touch with what patients actually need or what the up-to-date science actually is. Do you guys find that happening too when you're trying to reach out as advocates or as as an actual lab being able to being able to explain public health concerns? Yeah, so I mean the CRC like like it, it, it's, it's a government entity, right? So there's a lot of people that are put there from other departments within the state. They're not all um, very well educated in cannabis um, or understand cannabis products in general. One of the one of the main things that I um, that I really um, I think that they were really confused on different product types, including like concentrates and vapes, and understanding the difference between a cannabis vape versus like a nicotine vape um, and how, uh, you know, the concentrations um, of the active ingredient differ um, significantly. So which then impacted testing regulations where they wanted us to test for all these excipients where it's like, I mean, vitamin E acetate did contribute to the Uvalde crisis in 2018. Uh, that was a, like black market vapes being cut with vitamin E acetate and being sold on the black market. It wasn't anything to do with the legal industry. If um, it's like adding, saying that you're going to add like poison to your vape that you're gonna to sell to a customer and it's all traceable to you. Like the, it's not happening and it's never been proven to happen in the industry. But um, since there was a misunderstanding of what would be uh, put into a cannabis vape cartridge, they added on all these unnecessary testing regulations. So it's like all these um, issues that can be resolved through proper education and understanding of the industry um, can compound into <sighs> tests that would cost extra $500 per sample. You know, it's like not insignificant. It's like what they were asking of us was ridiculous. Hmm. And while that part is ridiculous, to adjust the testing batch limit on cannabis flower, would that do significant damage to like the cost of cannabis on the market by an MSO who's doing 100 pound test batches? Well, if you look at the other states that uh, MSOs operate in and look at the pricing that they charge in those other states and then look at the batch sizes, you can tell that it does not impact the end cost. Um, you know, That's true, actually, I didn't necessarily put that correlation together instantly, but Pennsylvania has a 25 pound batch size and significantly lower prices than we do. Um, I mean, Vermont has a 2.2 pound batch size and New Jersey cannabis prices are some of the highest in the country. So that alone is a perfect example of it it's really, yeah, I think I calculated it out. It's like five cents a gram at the top. Like even if it's only like a 10 pound batch, I think like anything more than that, it's like less than a penny per gram. So I think, you know, for the safety of the consumer that's paying $60 an eighth, they can, they can, Give us 10 cents of that. 
And while we've never had vitamin E acetate in our vapes on the legal market, we certainly have had yeast and mold issues on our legal market. We've had recalls and unfortunately we don't do enough investigations to necessarily even have them in time when each batch can expose 12,800 people if you broke it down to eighths. So it's a, it's a scary amount, but we have had mold issues as someone who has yeast and mold allergies. So, and asthma, so respiratory sensitivities, it's a, it's a really tricky market to know what to, what to trust or not. Um, you know, Pennsylvania recalled a bunch of stuff and they recalled vape pen cartridges. They recalled flour. They issued a bunch of recalls. And then the industry lobbied for a change in the testing regime. Suddenly there were no recalls anymore. Um, but I, I have to say that the industry has been very litigious against any recalls. Uh, Michigan regulators, Pennsylvania regulators, Pennsylvania regulators issued a recall on all the vape pens in the pretty much uh, almost, I think, 50 percent of the vape pens that were in every medical marijuana store. They went so far as to go to each of the dispensaries and seize them and hold them. The industry went to court and you know, fought the recall and successfully won, got the products back out of storage and sold them. So I, I don't think that the safety questions were ever actually answered, but the recall was fought in court on technicalities. So unfortunately, you know, we can do the testing, we can have the science, but the litigious industry is there also to fight the recalls and fight the science in court, even after they agree to do it in a contract. So that's been my experience, too. Even when there's a good testing regime and there are science-backed regulations being enforced and recalls are being issued, the litigious industry is, is there to do Empire Strikes Back on that in court, too. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that, you know, each uh, cannabis um, regulating body is, is definitely afraid of that as well, um, being uh, being sued in court and having to, to go over this. So they, they choose their battles, I believe. You want to see a recall, though. I mean, that's what consumers want to see. Consumers want to any recall that happens might be tough for a company to endure, but it's not the end of the world. And companies could handle this well. If they have a recall on their product, they can say, oops, we're fixing it. Especially Instead if it was a court. 10 pound batch size. Yeah. If you were only, you know, you wouldn't be willing to fight it as hard in court. There wouldn't be a reason to. Um so a secret shopper program and an adequate batch size could do a lot of good for public safety. And, and batch size, you, you guys, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to just say, and for keeping potential, you know, corruption in check. That may be true. Uh, you guys are working on batch size changing that in New Jersey. That's not a law that needs to change, right? That's not a law that needs to change. Um, the CRC based all of our testing regulations off of Maryland and then they put through a temporary batch size of 100 pounds years ago in an argument that they were trying to get enough cannabis onto the market. But now we have 100 active dispensary licenses and a $2 billion industry, and there isn't any real justification for it. It was never thought of as the safe option. Hmm. Um, it's dramatically higher than anywhere else in the country. and. Hmm. It was never pitched as the safe thing to do. They never really questioned the science on it. They just, it was a rush play and they never figured it was a priority to fix. But in terms of a lot of the people in New Jersey, we don't, we don't find the dispensary medications adequate for serious conditions. Um, we either, you know, and we don't really have any way of checking our medicine. You have to look individually at every COA for every product in the dispensaries. You can't just even pull them all up online. They have no regulations. They have the definition wrong for what concentrates is. Like they specify it has to be high THC and they ha that it has to use a solvent, which completely hmm. ignores, you know, live rosin. It completely ignores high CBD strains. Hmm. Um, so it's hard arguing with them that as a patient, it's a problem for me that there are butane residuals in the RSO legally on the shelves. It's a problem for me that, you know, companies will will back that, but you have to like figure out ways to even ask those questions. And 
to get them to understand the science and the complexities of all the different kinds of medication that cannabis can actually be if people were allowed to have individualized treatment with home grow or you know with the resources to have a say in any of it I'll give you a, i think it'd be a really different story but it's not where we are well you had asked about the price caps that's a bill that came out last week um you know, I, I do I do think that we need to increase the science. We were talking the other day that these commissioners are in a tough spot. They uh, they need to have some science on board. But I'm also asking them to be economists at the same time um, because it is a two billion dollar economy and um, they do have some responsibility here. Um, we have price controls in place for things um, like consumer commodities, like gasoline, even to make sure that prices don't suddenly inflate or get hyperinflated. So in Pennsylvania, we've been talking a lot about Pennsylvania. They have a price cap statute in the medical marijuana bill. And that's been seen as like helping as a stopgap against hyperinflation. A couple of years ago, the medical marijuana program director there through the Department of Health revealed the wholesale versus retail pricing in the program was off. The retail price was going up. The wholesale price was going down. And when he went public with that, all of a sudden there was pressure to have the price gouging stop. And we can see over the last 24 months since he announced that in 2022, that the price of medical cannabis in Pennsylvania has gone down significantly. In fact, now it's half as much as the price in New Jersey. So I just looked at the menus of Terrasend, Ascend, Cureleaf, Columbia Care, just the big six big ones that operate on both sides of the river. And I found that the one eighth price is twice the cost in New Jersey as it is in Pennsylvania from the same operators. Yeah, that slide right there is John Collins doing his big reveal in 2022. He kind of like went WikiLeaks and just threw this information out there. And at the time, the, the wholesale price was you know, six and seven dollars and the retail price was 13. You know, I just looked at the 2024 data and the wholesale price is, is down at eight bucks and the retail price is, I'm sorry, the wholesale price is down at 450 and the retail price is around eight bucks. So price caps work. If you don't have any teeth for regulators to negotiate a better price with big corporations, you really get a result of what we have in New Jersey, which is um, out of control hyperinflation. The, when I first started tracking prices way back in the day, uh, in 2013, when the dispensaries first opened here in New Jersey, they were charging 60 and $70 an eighth. And sadly enough, if you look at the menus today, it's not much different. Mm -hmm. And for the last 13 years, they've been saying, oh, Chris, you know, uh, just it'll just give it some time. The prices will come down, demand, supply, free market, blah, blah, blah. But we're not in a free market when you issue limited permits. It is a controlled market. And a free market means you don't have permits. That's a free market. Um, what we have that exists in cannabis is a very closely controlled permit system. That's not a free market. And we do the same thing with other stuff, kind of like gasoline. There's this thing called OPEC that sets the price of oil. But if we don't have price controls like price caps, we won't have anything but corporate greed setting the price for people. And that's not just playing out at the counter for patients and consumers. These large operators are now the wholesale supply for the small retail businesses, too. And they're really putting the squeeze on them with high wholesale prices. So price caps could be an answer in both directions here. They could help alleviate price gouging at the counter, but they could also put some pressure to stop the price fixing that's happening on the wholesale supply too. So, you know, again, they've never had to employ the price caps in Pennsylvania, but the data that you just saw on the screen, that was brought to the public as part of the language because part of price caps, you have to monitor prices and that's what got out of public. Okay, so we we lost you for a second, but oh, okay. I just want I just want you to clarify too that price caps mean price floors too, because a lot of people worry about the independent cultivators. And you said this is never implemented in Pennsylvania. 
and if we did price caps and price floors in New Jersey, it would be selectively implemented, right? So it would only be targeted against people found to be price gouging, and it would prevent large MSOs from undercutting the market price and driving new independent cultivators out of the market, right? That's definitely the theory. Um, you're right. We, we could probably employ price caps as a floor or a ceiling, which means that if you find that there's price gouging going on from a large operator, um, and, the, and you're also correct in that the price caps are not applied to the entire market. They are applied to individual operators for six months at a time, and they can be adjusted. So the CRC could identify an operator that is charging twice or three times more in New Jersey as they are in every other state in their network in the country and put a cap on there and say, well, your cap is set at the same price as you charge in Pennsylvania. Seems fair. Equalize the price in the region. On the other hand, you brought up the case, and we've seen this in Maine, especially as a good mm -hmm. example. Large operators come in and they're charging so much less that they're putting the little guys out of business. They're undercutting the market. And that's where a price floor could come in. That way that they couldn't undersell and they'd put a price floor in place to stabilize the market there. Again, if they're going, if the states are going to pursue these limited permit systems, they are going to have to have an active role in managing the economy there. They can't call it a free market and let corporations, predatory corporations at that, come in and run rampant an entire state, undercut local businesses, price gouge consumers. That is what happens. The history of America is built on corporations doing this in almost every market. We could maybe solve this early on with cannabis and teach it to other markets along the way too. Remember, cannabis is brand new. We don't have to take all these old ideas and act like they're good. There are a lot of bad old ideas that we can get rid of and price I, caps put people in charge. I know in New Jersey, it seems like we are trying to bring back quite a few bad old ideas like potency limits and their DUI bill that they're proposing. Because as far as I can understand, that has no logical scientific backing, but maybe Kristen would be able to chime in on how that kind of testing works or doesn't work, because I think they set the limit at three nanograms in your blood. And as a patient, I'm sure I'd test higher for a very long time, even if I never smoked again. Yeah, I mean, that's just, it's not going to tell you if you were like inebriated at the time of the test at all. Like, I think we would all fail this test. Like, there's no way around it. This It's ridiculous that they're even trying. They, uh, and Pennsylvania has zero tolerance. So any amount of cannabinoids convict you. Um, but the 3 NGML is very low. Um, Kristen's right there. Um, just to put that in context, the World Anti-Doping Agency, which covers uh, doping in Olympic sports, like, you know, all that stuff. After the Shikari Richardson thing, they actually set the threshold pretty high at WADA to 150 nanograms per milliliter. And they got that idea from the United States military. If you show up to pilot your airplane or drive your tank and you test below 150 nanograms per milliliter, you're good to go, Like, which is a lot. I mean, a lot. I would have to smoke like a quarter ounce in 20 minutes take an edible, take another edible, I'd be at 150 nanograms. I weigh a lot. So that would get me there. But 150 nanograms per milliliter, if you sustain that, now two nanograms per milliliter, we're all there right now. I'm probably, maybe it's like, what, 830? I'm probably more like 10 nanograms per milliliter right now. <laughs> but 150 nanograms per milliliter is actually a, a fair threshold. The idea that states want to set DUI down at three nanograms per milliliter would effectively prevent anybody who consumes cannabis from driving a car legally. That seems silly. So I wish I could say this bill's going nowhere, but they are introducing a bill like it every year. And it's not like uh, mean old Republicans. These are popular Democrats who are introducing these bills, which is concerning. 
They have a THC potency bill too. You mentioned that there is a THC. There's a we had to put it out on opposed THC potency limits in New Jersey. This was part of Chris Christie's original regulations. And you know what's interesting? You might appreciate this too, Kristen. Is that I had never seen THC separated from THCA until the first label came out in New Jersey. It was the first label I ever saw like that. That's because mm-hmm. they put a 10% cap on THC. Mm-hmm. And instead of figuring out how to grow plants below that, they figured out how to fudge the label. They came up with magic. It was magic. It was magic labeling. Well, I mean, it was incorrect in the regulations. Like uh, when they pushed that through, I, I remember at the time it was like, well, okay, flour is not going to have 10% Delta 9 THC. Right. So if you're not specific in the regulations, of course, there's loopholes and things like that. And the active compound that grows in the plant is THCA. It's not Delta 9 THC. And it won't be present at 10% unless you have it like sitting in the sun for three years. <laughs> well, uh, please don't do that to your marijuana, anybody, but, um, you know, or your cannabis, as 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 we're calling it in our quantum definitions of, of New Jersey right now. Um, but, you know, that's these things... Uh, when it comes to the nuances of science, that's where we're get. What, that's what we've gotten back from legislators: THC limits that are totally unscientific, and the intention was totally arbitrary because, again, they didn't look into the science of it. They didn't make the regulation specific. They wanted to be. They were like, "Dang stoners! They don't deserve any that that weed so much more potent than what my grandfather had." You know, that's that's where the THC cap came from. It wasn't scientific at all. Um, but I'm not sure where we're going to overcome all this stuff. The potency limits and all that. I, I tell people that we have a Star Trek tricorder problem. We don't have them. Is that police won't be happy about the DUI thing until they have a Star Trek tricorder to use on the side of the road. So that's our problem. Yeah, I think until the science catches up, but I don't think they're ready to listen to the science that we do have. So hmm. we got to start start wherever we can. Um, if they won't let us speak on home grow and the medical necessity, we'll speak on price caps. If we can't, if we can't, you know, if they won't have a secret shopper program, we can set up our own. You know, we still do have options in this state and we're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep fighting. Um, and I think the quicker we can get a group like the CRC to work with us or to open up communication for science, the quicker they might be able to advise legislators, because I know there was an inf- an invite only um, testimony in the assembly a couple weeks ago, back when we were in Trenton for the press conference. And Jeff Brown of the CRC spoke up and Bill Caruso, a lobbyist, spoke up. So we're getting closer to having like our voices heard in a sense. Well, I also heard heard Bill's theory of New Jersey being a pharma state and Schedule 3 being this big thing for the pharma industry. So that was couched in terms. I'm not sure how Big Pharma feels about us all growing at home. So we'll have to check in back with Big Pharma on that one day. Um, I'm not I, I, I don't know. I, I have this crazy idea that Santa Fe Aventis and GlaxoSmithKline and uh, Purdue Pharma probably don't have grow rooms in their research facility here in New Jersey where they made Oxycontin. They probably don't look like agricultural labs. So, um, but I would like it. I, you know, I, I do think that there's a better future for what Kristen's doing and the independent laboratory market. I think I've always wondered, that's the innovation gap that I think is missing from cannabis is the tech gap, is the laboratory gap, is that Again, we don't need to have big companies come and do this. New Jersey has a, a, a lot of people who are well trained. And it's, you know, I guess you could, Kristen, I'm sure it, it, it took a lot to, to start up your lab, but it, it doesn't take $50 million, right, to start up an independent cannabis laboratory. It's something that a, a small business owner can do. I mean, it's it's definitely um, expensive to buy the instrumentation required. Uh, it depends on the scope of testing that you want to perform. Uh, the most expensive uh, testing is for um, like uh, pesticide analysis, uh, where you mm-hmm. need very sensitive equipment because we're looking at very very low levels of those compounds. Um, 
But yeah, I, to your point of there's people in New Jersey, I mean, I was in third party testing before I started Tricom Analytical. I was in industrial hygiene, uh, like asbestos, lead and mold. Um, so, you know, lead in drinking water, like um, air abatement um, and things like that. And third party testing is not unique to the cannabis industry at all. I mean, there's a ton of industries that third party labs service, and this is just uh, one of them. So there's a ton of qualified people um, able to make that change and um, work in the cannabis industry or start their own lab. Or if, even if you don't have experience, just starting in, in a lab um, as a technician or something like that, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in New Jersey for that. When we're talking about opportunity in New Jersey to touch back on something Chris said about the pharmaceutical industry and Purdue not necessarily having a grow room, um, based on your experience, do you think these pharmaceutical companies have a tendency to lean towards synthetics, like even if they were to have the opportunity to work on this stuff legally? Is it yeah. cheaper in terms of manufacturing, testing, the whole nine? Yeah, I mean, you, you need much, much smaller footprint space, and it's a lot easier to work with like single compound. And I mean, um, so um, I, I think it would be I really don't see the pharmaceutical industry coming in and taking over like huge grows uh, to do any of this and the extraction and everything. It's not it's not very similar to to their current processes and they make a lot more money off of different types of drugs than cannabis for sure. Sure. You know, more addictive and have a lot of repeat <laughs> customers. <laughs> I can definitely see that being true. I know I have that same concern with psychedelics, not just synthetics, as laws loosen up. I know we decriminalized up to an ounce of straight psilocybin here in New Jersey when we passed recreational recreational cannabis. So that was a bit of a plot twist not many of us saw coming, and they are pushing for psilocybin legalization. Do you think that because of how much easier it is to manipulate those substances and test for them and stabilize them, that that type of research and testing and laws are going to be prioritized over something as complex as cannabis? Well, I don't know about the prioritization. I think as like um, a ph pharmaceutical like compounding facility would lean more towards like if they legalize like LSD or something because it's so easy to make the dosing is so well. Like if I could, uh, if LSD was legalized, I would try to get a license and just make a batch and be like, here, here's my here's uh, my income for the next 10 years. So, you know, I think uh, they would definitely uh, consider um, more so on the psychedelic side, depending on what is legalized. And that's why I think it is important to go about the legalization in a smart way, which I think starting with psilocybin mushroom cultivation is um, is, is a good direction for the, the legislature to start, um, which they have been doing. And I do like that the bill in New Jersey at least includes uh, medical home culti cultivation, not medical. I think home cultivation in general for psilocybin. Yeah, it, it is everyone. Cultivation across the board. Um, mm -hmm. And the same person blocking home cultivation for medical cannabis is the person pushing for home cultivation for psilocybin, which I was, that's why I was asking politically too, do you guys think this is going to, alter the way we look at legislation? Could it be because of the testing background? Uh, I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I have worked in the uh, psychedelic space, which is developing, and I did some contracting and did some PR work for some of the companies that are, you know, they have the, the organ facilitator training contracts and they're doing ketamine therapy in some places. So, um, and the psilocybin stuff is really getting corporatized very quickly. I mean, it took a decade couple of decades really for it to happen in cannabis, but I'm seeing that happen with psychedelics in like two years. Um, I, I, back to Kristen's point about the, uh, the way the, the compounds are and, and Andrew, your point about the simplicity of some of the synthetics. I think what's interesting in the last few years, you know, I heard that, you know, back when they, they made Epidiolex, which was the first FDA approved uh, plant-based cannabis medicine for seizures, there was this talk of it being this revolution in medicine. But the truth was, it was very difficult to make. It was, as Kristen says, outside of the practice of usual pharmaceutical manufacturing. So it turned out to be an expensive process. And 
they really, you know, it, it really didn't turn out to be the godsend everybody was thinking it was. However, there's another compound that's been around for a long time called Marinol, which is this uh, synthetic THC um, that is still prescribed to a lot of people, actually, in nursing homes and that type of environment. And that was always seen as more of what we expected Big Pharma to do, to look at the compounds within cannabis and then make synthetic analogs for them and then market those analogs, which is what they've tried to do. I, there was a study years ago, Santa Fe Aventis tried to make a THC uh, agonist, which would block all of your receptors. And they went so far as to take it to a human trial in France, and they gave it to a little over 10,000 people. And what was interesting about this, it was called Romanobant, uh, was the, the name that Santa Fe Aventis came up with it. What's really interesting is that when you block all of your THC receptors, um, it really messes with your whole body because your homeostasis is just really screwed up. But one of the interesting side effects of the, and they did not market the drug because it really hurt people. But about 200 of the 10,000 people came down with multiple sclerosis, a temporary, we can't replicate multiple sclerosis in patients. It's a, it has a really undefined disease pathway uh, for a chronic condition. So we still don't know what causes it. But we got 200 people to get temporary MS when we blocked their entire cannabinoid receptor system. So that was an interesting part of that research. But uh, anyway, uh, Big Pharma has been at this for a long time. They've been looking at ways to manipulate cannabinoid receptors and come up with synthetic derivatives of cannabinoid medications for a while. We had this all go wrong with K2 and Spice. Some of this came out... Um, you know, uh, JWH018 is a synthetic cannabinoid that was created to um, block all the cannabinoid receptors in rats so that they could test other compounds on them. That got out of the laboratory and people smoked it on potpourri and called it K2 and Spice. So this the the idea of synthetic cannabinoids being out there and Big Pharma working on it is definitely not new. Um I think what's funny is that they've never really marketed anything. I mean, Big Pharma has never come out and said, we've got an awesome cannabis-based pill that makes you hungry and happy. All you have to take one at the end of the day. Well, the issue is because the way federal regulations are and how hard it is to test actual full-spectrum cannabis mm -hmm. and how we only had one farm federally legally producing it for a very long time. I believe it was University of Mississippi. Um, and it was not certainly not representative of the cannabis that any anybody besides those handful of federal patients actually would ever use. Um, so they would have to test in isolates a lot of times and THC in isolate, which is what Marinol is designed to replicate. It's not designed to replicate full spectrum is shows some benefits, but not full benefits because it doesn't mirror the entourage effect. There's endless combinations of the entourage principle at play because everybody's body is different. So everybody's endocannabinoid system is going to function a little differently. And then every single cannabis plant is going to be grown to a unique thumbprint, essentially, when you get down to specific potency levels, terpene levels, flavonoid levels. It's they can't replicate it. So they can't come out and say it does everything great that cannabis does because they've never been able to make a synthetic medicine that does work as well and is worth celebrating as much as full full spectrum full plant medicine actually. actually. Oh, Marinol was terrible. I took Marinol a couple times just as an experiment. My friend had a prescription for it and I'm kind of a lightweight for edibles anyway, like five milligrams of a good edible and I'm like asleep. But um, the Marinol was a bizarre experience. It was just, um, it, it is uh, almost hard to describe. Uh, it wasn't like being high. It wasn't like a marijuana type high. Um, it, but it, it definitely was intoxicating, like intoxicating so much that I couldn't get out of the chair. So it was a very, and a lot of patients who take Marinol, the, especially the elderly, do complain of that, um, that it's just overly sedative, basically, is the way that it, it, it comes across. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think this, when you come to the targeted synthetics, having tried the Marinol, I can say it's not very fun. So I can see why they never marketed that as a, uh, as a depression, anti-depression or anything like that. And I think that's why it's so important to be able to know what's in your medicine and to customize your medicine. 
um, another person who is pretty passionate about understanding what's going on in testing and getting doing the best he can for people is Jake from UFC, UFCW, I'm sorry, who is a representative and labor organizer for the cannabis workers in this state. So if everyone wants to say hi oh. to Jake. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining in. I know you work closely with a lot of people that are affected by this both personally or that are in the industry. So it's always interesting to have your perspective on policy and on safety and on what patient options really are these days. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be included and, you know, hit me with the hardball questions. I've been listening in for the past hour and a half. Love the conversation so far. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. I'm excited. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining us. I know you've been at a few of our events down in Trenton, including some of the previous hot box for home grows and things like that. And with the CRC meetings, you tend to be pretty active or at least stay up to date on what's going on. Yeah, try to anyway, you know, it's yes, it's part of the job, but also cannabis is a passion. You know, if you're not paying attention to what's going on in both the community and the legislator around you, then you're kind of falling behind. Yeah, Chris has a way of saying the people who make the laws are the people who show up. So it's a matter of paying attention and showing up a lot of the times. So what has the union been working on recently in terms of getting involved with local shops or initiatives you might be backing? Do you happen to know? Yeah. So um, actually over the winter, we've been doing a lot of close work with uh, Shirali Patel um and the expungement clinic so we've been able to get more involved with that where um you know she's doing the expungements her and her group and we're bringing job leads for people where um if you're still waiting on your expungement and it's still on your record they'll accept you without um they'll accept you even with a background still or just any career path that might provide health benefits and at least you know a decent weekly paycheck for people that are trying to get back into it so that that's one of the things that we have probably had the most fun doing over the winter. Um, you know, it's the most to us. It feels like one of the most impactful things is being able to get out there and directly help the community on um, the organizing side. I don't even know if this is public news yet, but I'm happy to say that Rise Bloomfield, the dispensary and Rise, the cultivation site voted in their very first contract the other day. So they saw immediate wage increases and they all got an additional 40 hours of vacation time, which was pretty cool. That is that is pretty cool. It seems like you guys are really trying to help people with like the legacy to legal aspects in outside of the actual licensing pipelines that a lot of people are stuck going through, actually helping like the ground level people and the actual workforce. Um, and it seems like you're able to have a stronger voice because you're a collective. So it's been it's been really nice having you guys speak up on certain issues like home grow and agreeing to back um, changing the testing batch size again, which will, you know, hopefully keep a lot of people safe. And the more transparency we can get on legislation and on regulation and on science, the more educated we can have all of our bud tenders and everybody in the industry. Absolutely. So that'll make, you know, not only for a more educated workforce, but through that, you're also protecting just working class people in general. When you have safe access to medicine at an affordable price, now you could actually go out and live your life. You know, you can get rid of that chronic pain. You could treat some of your symptoms, you know, you can, um, you know, treat your seizures, all of that. So all of these issues, even though they don't necessarily sound like issues that a labor union should be taking up and be advocating for, they all affect working class people at the end of the day. So it is part of our responsibility to get in, the, get in there and be there with you guys. I, I know it was a big deal for me when the, even though I'm not, I wasn't part of the union, when the electrical union finally started allowing cannabis use, that was, that was a big change. Um, so to have unions actually backing the workers and trying to support the public is, is massive, but in order to properly support the workers, I think you do need scientific counsel too, because there are processes like remediation going on in this state. And some people think, oh, it's harmless and it does does nothing, but it's typically done with ozone or x-rays. And as a patient, sometimes it doesn't, the resulting medicine doesn't have the terpenes or anything that I need left in it. So how can you 
do you guys work with any science advisors or are you willing to be open to scientific oh, yeah. advice in terms of like safe ozone limits and things like that do you guys have so a we're always open to things like that especially when it comes to the safety aspect of our contracts at the cultivation sites um you know we don't have a scientist on staff we have a couple people that came out of some different cultivation sites with their firsthand experience and they're incredibly knowledgeable but to have a scientific advisor or somebody like that to advise the union that would be amazing you know, my, my background is not in science. My background is, um, well, a little bit more on the legacy side. You know, I came out of smoke shops. I came out of all that kind of stuff. So to have another person like that would just be incredible. I think it's been really cool seeing more people willing to be open to listening. Like I know the um, CTA, which is the Cannabis Trade Association, and the CBA were both willing to listen and they're willing to back home grow. I know in New Jersey, we have a lab testing committee that Kristen might be able to illuminate people on a little bit. And they would be a great resource for when people have questions, I think. Yeah, so uh, we're uh, a committee under the NJCBA, uh, which is the New Jersey Kind of Business Association. Um, we are a committee of um, not only operating laboratories within the within the state, um, laboratories that want to be operational within the state, and then um, scientific experts as well. Um, and we, you know, communicate guidance um, and recommendations to the CRC um, based off of all of our input um, and um, expertise there. And we would be happy to provide any, any guidance uh, to the CRC or to others um, regarding any of those issues, for sure. And I know that, um, you know, as far as like, what you were talking about with remediation and different types of technologies that you that's used either as a kill step or to remediate there are you know other concerns as far as like worker health and safety um that would maybe fall more under like osha's purview uh to ensure that there are um you know minimal levels of um of ozone in the air uh, that's being generated with that process or the proper security and safety precautions are being uh taken with the other types of remediation as well. Oh, you're muted. I think it's really important the more we can coordinate these kinds of conversations because right now there really isn't necessarily an OSHA that's up to date on the science specifically relating to cannabis. Like we don't know certain respiratory risks involved in the industry yet. And I know next next episode, I'll happen to have Dr. Tess Edom, a microbiologist on to hopefully talk about some of the potential concerns and like the upcoming research we hopefully might be able to look forward to coming out over the next few years. Um, I think I think it's been interesting to see all the different angles that started to pull together in this fight for home grow recently, because none of us necessarily knew each other before a couple months ago. And over the last few weeks, we've ended up communicating quite a bit or suddenly becoming friends or realizing we have a bit more in common than we used to. So I was just curious what everyone knows, like I'm here because I'm, I'm sick right now and I'm fighting for my personal medical rights. That's what got me active in advocacy. So what got each of you actually kicked off on this journey? I mean, Chris, I think you've been doing it the longest because I heard your report on Jim Miller's walk 31 years ago. Oh, so you've at least been reporting on it. So yeah. what got you actually started on this? Um, you know, I was in, I, I always was smoking marijuana in the 1990s in Philly. And um, I went to the University of the Arts for theater and stage combat. And everybody in theater school smoked weed and partied really hard. So I had a blast. Um, and I was in, I, I have to say, in the, in the middle 1990s, uh, Philly had a really interesting scene for marijuana. It was really well known in the whole country as having like this really vibrant sort of hippie-ish scene for weed. So I got to experience that when I went to college there and I was blown away. I, I got introduced to the whole cannabis community and got connected with all these people and, and saw it all right away and was really impressed. Um, and then I moved to New Mexico and in Santa Fe, I learned 
that this community of hippie cool weed people in Philly was like nationwide and they were everywhere. It was amazing. We're like the Fremen in Dune. We're just, you, you can't define how many of us are out there. We're like a power. So there are all these sieges. So there are these cannabis sieges all over the country, full of hash oil, you know, but, um, I, I was really blown away by that. And I got into public radio out there and I decided to start talking about marijuana reform on my radio show. And I connected with National Normal and I started reading their press release on my radio show. And it was like super popular. We we're a public radio station and in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And all of a sudden, my little segment at 10 o'clock at night talking about weed was getting $10,000 worth of donations. Like that was like half of all the donations the station was getting during a fundraiser. So I was really keyed in really fast to how popular it was, how much information people needed to hear. So I decided to become a marijuana journalist and I started up some podcasts and started writing. And um, it really, I thought I would cover everything in like a year. And all of a sudden I got hired to do like a daily podcast in 2005 and I still feel, you know, I did like 700 episodes and I, I still haven't covered everything related to marijuana. So, and I went to school on how to be an activist. And so when I moved back East from New Mexico, I realized that marijuana reform in New Jersey and, and Philly needed a boost. And I helped form up some normal chapters. And I took all that I learned from doing the podcast from everybody else and tried to do the hard part, which is actually change the law. So, um, and so, I, you know, I've, I've had a, I've been lucky. Like I said, our movement, unlike homelessness and other things, uh, has these great successes. And um, we have had in the time that I've been involved, we have gone from absolute criminal prohibition to a country full of screwed up, but still laws that are not as screwed up as uh, arresting everybody at gunpoint every time you see them with weed. So I I'm I'm lucky. I came to it as a social justice activist and a journalist, and I've come out of it now today as uh, I don't know what I am. A, a grassroots organizer um, is the best way I describe myself because um, there needs to be more of that in the country. So I, I hope more people do that, do that kind of thing. Yeah, I definitely appreciate everything you've done since then, too. It's not I know that's a short part of your history out of out of all the work you've put in and you've always been a citizen activist, which is, which is pretty cool. And it shows that anybody can actually get involved with this. And I know Kristen, you were speaking earlier about how people actually can get into the testing world and get into the science world. And how did you get in from the science world actually back into the advocacy world? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a, I actually was contacted by the um, New Jersey Bar Association Cannabis Subcommittee on, um, they had a question regarding home grow. I guess someone was trying to make an argument against home grow saying, well, you know, they can't get it tested, it's not safe, blah, blah, blah. And so I, uh, you know, debunked that and I sent them all the um, quotes from NJAC 1730. I cited all the regulations, like, no, they can perform personal use testing. And then, you know, that kind of got me curious and um, like uh, just more involved, I think, in what um, what was happening at the time, because I was really kind of in my own world in the lab. Um, you know, you just kind of shut the doors and you don't participate in society. Right. You just run samples. Um, so that's what I was doing for the last, you know, 20 years or whatever. So um, by getting just a better idea of what was happening with homegrow in New Jersey. I was uh, speaking with the, the lawyer that reached out to me and um, we uh, decided to co-author a piece just debunking this uh, this theory that, well, homegrow is not allowed because it's not safe because it's like, well, what are the reasons that this is being blocked still in New Jersey? So we came up with a list of reasons and we're like, but none of these make sense at all. So we, we wrote an op-ed, um, we had that published in um, the uh, New Jersey NJ.com or whatever. And then it was like the following day that uh, Phil Murphy was asked on his um, daily or weekly briefing or whatever, like, what, like, what's your opinion on homegrown? He's like, well, you know, let the industry time to develop. So they didn't use any of the excuses that we had wrote, written in the op-ed um, of like the taxes and, and all of that. And we're like, the industry, but like, I'm in the industry. 
So then we started pulling the industry and we're like, okay, the NJCBA like is not against it. NJCPA even is not against it, right? And that's all of like the big MSOs that were operating in medical. So it's like, well, who's against it? So we started pulling all of the dispensaries coming online. We're like, yeah, there's no one that's against home grow. So then we moved towards the, you know, the industries in support and I got connected with all of you good folks and we were able to push that together, uh, you know, just kind of highlighting the hypocrisy and uh, learning about the political process in New Jersey has been uh, very interesting, to say the least, I think. Uh, the, the amount of corruption and, and everything is really, uh, really interesting. Yeah, early in the show, Chris and I were discussing a bit about how New Jersey corruption is a, is federally unique compared to a lot of different states in terms of the extents they go to. And we touched on things like today's lame lame duck day out of nowhere where they tried to gut Oprah essentially and made significant progress in doing so. Um, well, they passed those bills. They passed those bills. They wrote them last week and they passed an assembly and Senate committee today. They expect to have floor votes on them tomorrow. They, they did things today for that Oprah bill that we wish would happen for a good piece of legislation like home grow. Like they substituted the no voters. So they knew that there would be people on the committee who might vote no. So the committee chair subbed them out and put people on the committee that day who would be guaranteed to vote yes. That's what they did today. Um, you know, today was really a good example, actually. I mean, we I, we have to make sure that we don't lose context on the home growth thing. You're right. The New Jersey legislature is unique and annoying. And it's uniquely opaque, without sunshine. They do things behind closed doors. They write bills. They fast track them. And what we saw today with uh, gutting the Open Public Records Act uh, legislation was unfortunately a real good example of that. But don't get deterred. If you can do things here, and again, if you can get involved with civics through cannabis and you can get some success and move on some stuff, if you can get something done in Trenton, Doing something in Washington, D.C. will almost seem easy. <laughs> well, I think that's the secret is a lot of the people trying to fight for cannabis rights never really wanted to be involved in politics and don't love the idea of going and following it up in D.C. But I think everybody on this panel is pro descheduling, which, Jake, what actually got you into advocacy? Because we didn't get to touch on that yet. I know you said you had a background it were experienced in some way with the legacy market. Yeah, so I guess, uh, my path is a little different. And out of the four of us here at the moment, I would definitely say, you know, I'm, I'm the newbie of the group. I'm the newest one that's been involved in all of this. I'm only a few months in, so welcome. Hey, snap. Hey, welcome. Happy to be hey. here. But um, what got me involved, particularly with cannabis, was um, I, I was a late bloomer to cannabis. I didn't smoke in high school. Um, a whole lot of personal stuff going on, which is actually part of the story. Um, my dad had an opioid addiction during uh, the 2008 opioid crisis and, you know, the following years and stuff. And unfortunately, he passed away. And throughout that as well, I lost a couple friends for um, the same reasons, through abusing opioids and just that's unfortunately what happened. Um, when I discovered cannabis and I started using cannabis to treat both my body pain and to work in conjunction with um, my mental health, I discovered essentially a new world. And I believe it's a world that would have saved the lives of both my friends and my dad if opiates would have, you know, been pushed to the wayside and cannabis would have been pushed on them. So th through that, and then I've also been passionate about workers' rights. Um, through college, through high school, I worked. Um, I always worked, you know, whatever the paycheck job was, whatever I could get. And, you know, I was always treated, or not always, but generally fairly poorly treated by my bosses. So I would always try to get, like, us together as coworkers and be like, hey, we got to stand up. We got to demand better without really, like, knowing about the union process or anything like that. Um, so fast forward a little bit. I'm working at a chain of smoke shops. And we decide to unionize, um, or I should say they decide to unionize. I was a manager at the time, so I couldn't join the union, but um, I helped out where I could. I lost my job during that process, and the union gave me a shot at being involved with cannabis on a larger level. So um, I got involved through that. 
I'm happy to be involved. I love standing up for people who feel the same way that I did at those jobs where, you know, you might be working for an MSO and you've never seen your boss because they're like 40 states away, but they're making crazy decisions on your workplace. And I like being able to empower those people to stand up and say, hey, this isn't right. And we kind of deserve to be treated a little better. So um, it, I guess a combination of factors got me into the advocacy world. And I'm real happy to be here. I'm happy that, you know, everybody kind of welcomed me with open arms as an extra, you know, pair of hands to help out with. And um, anything I could do to help, I'm going to keep on doing, whether it's at the legislative level or just boots on the ground action. You know, a little a little civil disturbance goes a long way sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I think we've I think we've seen that play out before or just any kind of civil demonstrations and then civil disturbance both tend to have positive <laughs> effects. Got to start somewhere. Um, Absolutely. I mean, Chris, we, we covered earlier in the show before you were on here that Chris was involved in a couple civil demonstrations, civil. Yes, I was listening in at that time. I heard some of the stories. I, I know there's encouragement for people to take action in New Jersey, but the problem is we want to make sure it's effective action because yeah. as much as I've offered to go in front of the Senate and trigger a seizure with sh cannabis found in the dispensaries and stop it with strains not currently available, there's no point in me doing it outside while they ignore me. Patients have put their lives on the line for years doing demonstrations. So if there were to be any kind of protest or organization it should be it should be well thought out and considered and it shouldn't constantly be patients on the front line but i know a lot of patients are willing to be um, yeah, and i agree with that in 93 actually jim miller and was fighting for his wife cheryl's rights for her ms medicine for cannabis back then in new jersey and he pushed a wheelchair from seaside all the way to trenton the entire width of the state. And I know I would be willing to do that if that's what it took to get these senators' attention. But we got to make sure it counts. So the more hands on board, the bigger something we can do. I'd love to see like joints across New Jersey. I would love to pass a joint all the way from Seaside Heights to Trenton and have a whole line of people up 195. We could do joints across New Jersey. That would be very fun. I would like to see, you know, um, I like the, you know, I was there for Jim's uh, for, and he did it several times too. He didn't just do it once. He did it several times. And it, it, that is a difficult and committing protest for sure. You get a lot of attention at the front. You get a lot of attention when you arrive and it's very lonely in between. So when we do this again, if, if, if we pull this off again, we want attention throughout the way. I would love to have like joints across New Jersey. I think that we could actually inspire that. I think if we said everybody should line up between the, the skinniest part of the state, between Trenton and Seaside Heights, because that is the shortest distance between the Delaware and the shore right there. We could almost do it. We have to sit down and crunch the numbers and see how many people it would take. There's about six. You get a six foot stance per person in a distance there. So how much, how many miles is it? It's like 53 miles, 5,000 feet a mile. So you need about 800 people per mile. So we need about 3,000 people. Okay. We need 3,000 people to do joints across New Jersey. That's not so bad, actually. And also 3,000 joints. I, each one, now that it would take one joint, it, one giant joint has to start <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna need like a trailer you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you put that in perspective three thousand people isn't isn't a lot of people it doesn't take as much engagement as people think and it's not always a miserable time to do that a lot of these rallies and sessions are people hanging out and smoking and sharing their medicine or conversating over shared ideals or trying to figure out how to overcome boundaries and stigma that they both face. You know, it can be something fun like that. We can call for the stop order. We can do clones across New Jersey hmm. if we wanted to. We can pass like, ooh, we can pass a plant the entire way while we all stand there smoking. So we're not 3,000 people 
sharing germs because I have a limited immune system. <laughs> She's like the Olympic torch. But oh, we, yeah. I mean, we can, amazing. We can definitely the do the Olympic right torch. Right there, I love it. We could, we could do the <laughs> Olympic blunt across New Jersey. <laughs> that would be great. And then, like the Olympics, when you get to Trenton, there's got to be like a big urn with like a hundred pounds of marijuana mm -hmm. and you put the torch there, you know? So just one batch. You yeah, just one batch. Just, just, one batch. <laughs> just one batch. That's funny. You know, when I was a kid, they had a thing called Hands Across America and I participated. It oh, was I like in 1984. Mm -hmm. It was the coolest damn thing. I mean, everybody was into it. I can't tell you. I really, of all the things when I was a kid, that was really one of the most inspiring things that happened. It really got people engaged. It was something very cool. So I think we might have come up to something very cool here. We might we might be able to do it. We'll, we'll have to think more about joints across New Jersey as a, as a civil disobedience action. Because I think civil disobedience is good, obviously. And, and as a Quaker, I really believe in it. Um, but I think that you have to up the scale of it. So like when we mm -hmm. went and did smoke down prohibition, we didn't go out once. We promised to come back every month for a year. <laughs> that was just like so annoying to them. Um, so I think that if we plan to do this, you know, uh, uh, you know, push across New Jersey, I think we need to up the scale a little bit and um, and and definitely get a, a, a greater scale on participation here this time. But I, I think it's worth it. Um, a, a couple of uh, a little bit of participation, uh, a little bit of celebrity participation. It could be a lot of fun. We could also, a lot of people have said, do a march over a bridge like the Ben Franklin Bridge, connect a couple of states together or yeah. connect New York on one of the New York bridges. Actually talk to the Ben Franklin Bridge, the Delaware River Port Authority. There is a, there is a public sidewalk on the Ben Franklin. They were totally cool with us marching from one side, marching to the other, meeting in the center of the bridge. No problem. So we could also do something like that. Um, I mean, if they want to do interstate commerce, why can't we do interstate <laughs> solidarity? In New Jersey, they're looking to push a bill that would allow the governor special permissions for certain interstate commerce. So essentially, I think they would get to pick and choose what interstate commerce is actually allowed from New Jersey, which, while it would ideally benefit products like Canitol, which is a rescue epilepsy medication, a nasal spray made in Colorado, I have a feeling it would be used to benefit the MSOs to continue to further price gouge in this state. Yeah, I have some rumors on that bill that it's basically just for New York and New Jersey, which would be kind of scary. It would be just for MSOs to trade product between the two states. Um, I don't like, there are a lot of bills I don't like that are introduced this year. That's definitely one of them. We have, there are almost two dozen cannabis related bills in New Jersey right now. And I can only identify four that are really good. <laughs> so, a little um, scary. It is. I have to say, I wrote a blog earlier this year saying that the New Jersey legislature had kind of an anti-consumer agenda. You know, you got the 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 THC DUI bill, the THC price caps bill. Um, you've got all these things that would negatively impact New Jersey's millions of cannabis consumers. You know, when we talk about that DUI thing, I mean let's kind of estimate how many people consume cannabis regularly in New Jersey that would have three nanograms per milliliter in their system. Nine million people in the state, 100,000 people in the medical marijuana program, and I would guess about 1.5 million regular consumers. So that's a giant chunk of the state you're trying not to get drive, you know, or go to work in their car or work at Uber Eats with their car. You know what I mean? Um, the idea of restricting driving in the gig economy is really something that comes hard on working class people. So um, that this is, is really, really tough bill. They're looking to roll out entire cannabis free zones, which while <laughs> some people might be like, oh, this is fine for like blocking out playgrounds or around the state house, which is what they're trying to argue. It would allow essentially entire townships to opt out of allowing people to consume cannabis there which as a medical patient is terrifying to think that if I were to have a seizure, someone might have to drive me past the border before I could even have my medicine. And then what does that create other than a micro drug war 2.0 in that town? 
Those are silly. I mean, and again, for I mean, keep in mind right now, there are no beaches where you can smoke marijuana. We have dog beaches. We have a nude beach, clothing optional beach, but there's no beach where you can smoke weed. That's ridiculous. OK, again, we haven't really we've legalized marijuana. We've created a two billion dollar economy, but we have stopped doing the consumer rights issues. I mean, that's why I remain a consumer rights advocate. I would like marijuana smoking beaches. I do not want any cannabis free zones. Heck, I've got a problem with all the beer gardens that pop up everywhere, for God's sake. You know, like turn a corner, there's a beer garden in the playground. There's a beer garden at the mall. It's like you can't walk without stepping in a cornhole at a beer garden. It sucks. And meanwhile, they want to create cannabis free zones and you can't smoke marijuana on the beach. We're really, we have a gap here between what alcohol consumers enjoy and what cannabis consumers enjoy. And if we could get half of what the drinkers get, I'd be a happy camper, you know? I feel like it's also apples and oranges, though, because we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to alcohol or even any of the other drugs when in New Jersey, we've decided this is a medicine. We, It's been legalized as a medicine for a long time. We should be comparing our rights to insulin, to every other medicine that's on the market. Because even the medical home grow bill right now has language initially in it that would punish patients where if you did were home growing legally and you gifted even less than an ounce of it, you would be permanently kicked out of the program, fined additionally, and essentially that would permanently lose your hospital access or your right to medicine if you need strain specific medicine. It's it's a scary situation here in New Jersey because people are uneducated, people are uninformed. And I think there's still a lot of old stigma and a lot of big corporate money that prevents people from taking the steps towards education. So collecting these voices from multiple angles and spoon feeding it to them in a way they'll hopefully understand might be our only, our only option here. I always thought that we'd get to a point where there would be more legislators who were smoking weed in front of the state house with us. Like it is three years on. If you go to the New Jersey League of Municipalities, these legislators unabashedly, I mean, I hate to make too many comparisons to alcohol, but if you go to the New Jersey League of Municipalities, they pour free beer and liquor all day. They have to start at four o'clock. They're not allowed to do it before then. But at four o'clock, you will find every mayor and city council person finding their way over to that beer area at the at New Jersey League. So I'm surprised that we don't have more legislators openly as consumers, like helping us in this regard. I really thought like three years down the road, we'd see legislators have like, I don't know, blunt and a bong fundraisers for their Senate campaign. You know, um, I, I, I think that they'd win a lot of votes and get some support that way. But again, they have remained very standoffish as consumers to cannabis. And um, I really do find it weird. Uh, and it's not just here. I don't see any legislators doing it in most states. It was just the other day that the Clark County supervisor, his name is Tick Segerblom, and he used to be a legislator in Nevada. He went to Las Vegas' first cannabis lounge and he lit up a joint. And that was like a big deal. But he's just the county commissioner. He's the Clark County commissioner. Um, still, even in states like Nevada and New Jersey and New York, you don't see state legislators. God forbid you see Governor Murphy sitting down, having a joint at the end of the day. I thought it would happen. Guess not. You know? Maybe Instead, he's just not a flower a guy. <laughs> once in a blue moon, one of them will come up to you and like, hush, hush, like, oh, yeah, that smells like some good stuff. Or like, hey, check out this little thing I got. <laughs> Oh, Jake, I've had legislators smoke with me. I mean, I had a Pennsylvania <laughs> state legislator. I lit a joint about five years ago in front of, I literally, I walked out the front door in Harrisburg. It had been a long day and I lit up a joint and this guy in a suit behind me said, it smells really good. And I was like, do you want something? He's like, yeah. And I recognized him and I was just like, wow, that's like the dude from Philly. What? <laughs> you know, but I've, and, and again, I've had, I, I do think it's funny. I've had more legislators wink, wink, nudge, nudge and say, you know, we could really support this, Chris. But, you know, my constituents just won't let me like give me a break. You know, um, I, again, I do find the 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 political atmosphere for cannabis would change a lot if we had more consumers in office. 
And I am surprised that there are more aren't more unabashed consumers running. Like yep. I, I do think that's what's going to be next. Um, like there has to be people who are running for office that will realize that not only are we out here and we vote, but all you have to do is light a joint and we'll like like you. Like it's so easy. It's like such an easy exchange. There was a Senate candidate in Louisiana who did this and um, and another one in Georgia. It's not unheard of. But we just haven't had it here, happen here yet. I am curious. I mean, Andy Kim just signed for the Moore Act. I wonder if his campaign trail is going to be consumption friendly along the uh -huh. way. That's interesting. Um, you know, that's an interesting way to put the test. I mean, I, you know, I don't think that in any regards that we're going to see any of the campaign events officially, but a lot of campaigning happens in people's houses. It happens in their dining rooms and their backyards. Uh, the house party is really the format of a lot of political campaigns. So you bring up a good point. Um, I don't think that politicians can avoid it in that house party format. Um, that's an interesting point. That's a very interesting point. I'd like, like to see that. We'll see. I'd be, I'd be curious to find out. Um, yeah. And I've noticed people in the chat having some debates on like the safety of rec versus home grow and like the optics of it and how much patients care or not. I think one of the details that people are missing is rec and medical patients, if they were both home growing, they would both have the right to test and could test as much as they want. Um, and also medical patients, not everyone grows their own tomatoes. New Jersey is the garden state, but you're allowed to grow your own tomatoes. It's not going to affect the market. It might not be worth it to you, but if there's a parent or an individual who has serious medical conditions or high levels of sensitivity to pesticides or needs certain nutrients that aren't available in a lot of ways and they might try microgreens, it's going to be worth it for them to garden at home. Now, it might not be worth it for everybody to garden at home, but the people that need to are going to put in the work to do it right because their life depends on it or at least they're going to do their due diligence and try probably. Um, and in terms of, you know, making ourselves look foolish, like rec customers in terms of fighting for our rights, there isn't too, I mean, if you have any ideas, you're welcome to drop them in the chat for other ways to get press or things or attention or to advocate besides dying waiting for the medicine because that's the position a lot of people are in or it's leave the state i know it'd be a lot safer and easier for me to leave the state than to sit here and have tremors and glitch out and have seizures a little bit and stuff or to try and get back and forth to trenton when i can't drive right now it's easier for people to stay quiet or to leave so if you have ideas for how to come together definitely hop on board a lot of the people here came together and didn't necessarily have a specific idea for it. They came up together over their passion for growing is a big one for home growers, whether they're cultivators or patients. And the cool thing is these people around us have actually put together a few different ways for you to get involved if you want to. Um, we have njhomegrow.com, which is actually up. So if you wanna check out any articles or press for things that have been going on, um, if you want to join any of the normal committees so you can actually get involved and have your voice heard. We have pre-written emails if you want to send out. I mean, if any, Kristen, would you like to chime in on some of those? What's going on on njhomegrow.com? Yeah, so we consolidated a lot of like the, um, a lot of the information for, so that people could have one uh, direct source where they can gather everything. Uh, the the main um, the main buttons are email templates. So these are just mail to links. It's not like you know taking any of your information or anything. It'll just open up an email template on your uh, mail app on your phone, um, and you can send that email to the entire Senate, the entire Assembly, and then their committees, uh, which the medical bill that we that has the majority of support that we're trying to get pushed through um, is referred to. So we're requesting meetings from these committees um, so that it can go up uh, for discussion and hopefully we can comment on it um, request the two changes that we're looking for one of the changes is changing the uh the limited for uh plant count to a 10 by 10 canopy area this will allow for proper pheno hunting 
uh, for medicinal needs, as this is a medical bill and it should uh, allow the patients to grow for uh, their medical purposes. The second change that we're looking for is the elimination of the unnecessarily harsh uh, punitive measures uh, that this bill puts on furnishing homegrown medical cannabis to others. Uh, we believe that that, you know, uh, currently it's not, um, you, as a medical patient purchasing uh, cannabis at a dispensary, you're not supposed to furnish that to others. And um, we don't believe there should be any additional punitive measures uh, if it's homegrown versus store bought. So we're recommending the removal of that entire section. If that section stayed in, um, patients are at risk of losing their ability to register in the program for their entire lives. So that one time furnishing uh, their homegrown cannabis to another individual um, would ban them uh, permanently from the medical program, which is just bizarre. I mean, if you were a, a diabetic and you gave your friend some extra insulin that you had, um, who was also a diabetic, uh, you, that doesn't ban you from getting insulin ever again and condemn you to like death, right? So I don't know, maybe just me, that shouldn't be in there. So that's what we're asking for, those two changes. Also on the website, we will be updating with like future events. Um, I think our old events still up there, uh, but there's some additional information. And then there's also like a normal uh, email template um, form uh, that you can put your information in and that goes directly to your specific uh, representative in New Jersey instead of like the entire state uh, Senate and assembly. I like this email all 120 at once, you know, just get them all. <laughs> but uh, and then we also have a forum where you can sign up to be involved um, with us and join um, one of our working committees and, um, you know, uh, talk with us every other week and um, figure out what we're doing and help uh, plan uh, future press conferences or events. Yeah, absolutely. I know our the next hot box for Home Grow Day that we currently have booked at the State House is going to be the 28th. So anybody who wants to come hang out and smoke and get educated or get involved is absolutely welcome to come out to the Trenton State House, thanks to Sativa Cross, who booked that permit for us. Um, I know a few of you were at the last one. There's, there's a different energy, it seems, than the last couple of years when I've gone to different like home grow lobby day events. It seems like it seems like people are willing to finally speak up. Um, I know there's been there's been a lot of trauma from the prohibition over the years for people essentially where they feel the need to stay quiet and stay silent. And that's why calling for the stop order on home grow arrests would be such a big start because then people would actually feel safe to have their medicine and to still come out and fight for the rest of their rights they, they need like hospital access or against illogical DUI standards, because that's going to affect the regular recreational customer too. That's not going to be only patients. Oh. And I think one of the aspects we haven't heard yet is from growers. So I'd like to bring in the other guest that we have here tonight, who is Sam, and he's actually been involved with the legal industry in terms of working in dispensaries, but also working with Green Dragon and knows quite a quite a bit about growing. So hi, Sam. Thanks for joining us. I think you're still muted, though. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix my camera a little bit. Um, how are you guys doing, though? Good to see you, man. <laughs> Good to see you as well. Uh... Well, I think Sam's a little caught up for a second. Yeah, sorry. Just give me one minute. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. I know a few of us are probably going to cross paths again this week at the CRC meeting, too. Um, because it seems like the more people we can get actively involved and sharing their own voices and perspectives, the better it is. So it's too late for anybody else to register to speak in person Wednesday at the CRC meeting but you are absolutely welcome to submit a written testimony up until Thursday. So if you want to get involved with that too, feel free to reach out to anyone through the njhomegrow.com website or reach out to me directly. I think 
Sam still seems to be glitching out a little bit, but. <laughs> How do you guys think interstate commerce is going to affect lab testing? Well, I think, um, you know, if there was descheduling, um, it would help certain labs, I guess, be able to test from other states. I mean, we're DEA registered for Schedule One substances. We work on the federal level as well. So I think it would be something similar to that. Um, now, for each individual state program, they have different testing uh, regulations. So New York tests for different compounds than New Jersey does because every state like likes to copy one state and then add on like four new compounds. And so there's no one, there's no two states that actually mirror each other with laboratory testing. So it's a little difficult for labs then to be able to like really supply that compliance um, test uh, to those uh, other labs unless they're uh, to those other states uh, with the different uh, compound requirements. But I mean, it's not impossible. Like right now, I, uh, our lab works a lot within the New York cannabinoid hemp program. So those were regulations that were adopted a couple of years ago um, that require all CBD products in New York um, for to get like a full panel test uh, for specific compounds. There's like 67 pesticides, mycotoxins, metals, and potency and all that. There's a lack of enforcement in New York right now, um, but it's technically required. It's just, you know, no one's, not, a, not everyone is doing it. Um, so we are able to test like CBD products and hemp products across state lines or on the federal level. I think it would be something similar to that. And, um, you know, I would welcome it. Um, I, I don't think that um, lab testing would be at the same risk as maybe some other businesses if the, the lines, uh, state lines were, weren't in place. Um, but it's also about... Um, working within a state registered program. So even the scheduling is not going to like legalize cannabis businesses across uh, the country. Um, you'll still have to be registered within a program and operate under those program regulations. So I really don't see a significant change as far as like cultivation and manufacturing. I think it would still be, um, you know, there still would not be interstate commerce with the scheduling. Now, if they allow interstate commerce through the bill that's proposed in New Jersey, um, I think that is intended to benefit only, you know, the multi-state operators so that they can move product where it's cheaper to grow into other, um, other states. Yeah, it seems like we see a lot of that where, you know, the multi-state operators are the ones that kind of get the first thought, even though they're telling us they're not the ones getting the first thought. But, um, but thank you. Thank you for explaining that a little bit for me. No problem. I think it might give certain people an option to fight back in states where they don't necessarily have enough labs. Like I know Chris was saying, Pennsylvania only started with four. So if the program were to change and a lot of new cultivators were to come online, you know, they might be able to lean on New Jersey as long as they were testing to Pennsylvania standards because they have a 25 pound batch size, which is a lot more stringent than our current one, but more lenient than the one we started with. And that's based off of Maryland. Um, so I think it does throw a few different things into, into question and the difference in interstate commerce being whether it's the governor's special allowance programs or whether it's full federally descheduled interstate commerce. I think they're, it would change the playing field in two different ways. Yeah, certainly. Um, definitely different considerations with each of those. Coming from third party testing, I mean, we're, we're, any other industries that a uh, third party laboratory services is not um, constrained by state. Uh, so, you know, coming from that world, I prefer to get, you know, my samples in the mail uh, whenever I can. Um, I think that's just how, you know, testing generally operates in every other industry besides cannabis, where you're restricted to one state because it can't go over state lines. Um, so I think it would be a positive thing um, versus I know, you know, MSO laboratories, they have multiple very like small laboratories, like, you know, some only 2,000 like, square feet uh, within each state where, I don't know, I feel like you have a better, better control over quality and um, your end result and accuracy and things like that. If you're, if you're working in, a, in a, like a larger footprint or more samples, you're, you're better able to, to service your clients um, as far as analytical testing goes. I think standardization across the board is going to be 
key so then people can make educated comparisons and educated dis decisions when they are choosing where to where to actually go for their laboratory testing and i think we need that education and standardization badly because certain states and certain we can't even be sure right now that different labs are using the same types of testing we have no reason for different solvents to be labeled on our packaging in new jersey and we have no way to verify what those tests actually are or confirm or test against them after a 30-day window of when the test was run in the first place so it's a little bit it's a little bit tricky to actually catch all these problems if we don't have more educated individuals involved and right now as a patient i can't go in the dispensary and always ask the bud tenders about certain questions and when we switch to having home grow we're going to need people to be able to answer questions about how to do that safely too whether it's getting your own coas or whether it's asking experienced grow shops like green dragon so sam is your microphone working at this point you actually yes, with us it is there you are <laughs> all right what's sorry i've been out a little bit but um yes we do offer testing down at green dragon um we offer that through Kristen. She's been awesome uh, in helping us get that set up and get that going. And uh, also adjusting the uh, testing to be more um, useful for home growers, I guess is what I would say. There's certain things that the state either is extremely strict on or is just not as common in a, I guess, in a home cultivation setup. Uh, so she was able to adjust what we test for to be more relevant to home cultivators. Uh, and that's been really awesome. Um, I love working down at the shop and meeting all of the growers. Um, I think it's really cool. I think, uh, I think growing is one of those things that not everyone will do, but if you decide to do it, it'll probably be the best flower you are able to find in my opinion. Oh, you're muted, Andrew. Experience both. I know you have experience both as a patient and working in the legal industry. So are there any concerns you have with the legal industry or things you wish you saw that you don't see there yet as a patient? Um, there's, there's definitely some things that I would like to see changed about the industry. Um, one of those things being just transparency in general. Um, I found that it's really difficult to get answers to questions uh, within the legal industry. Um, I've been going back and forth with the CRC for the past few weeks about a product. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like our regulators understand what RSO is. Um, and for patients, especially, especially experienced patients, um, that can really make a big difference. Um, we know what RSO is, and unfortunately, the people that are in charge of making sure the stuff on the shelves are is RSO don't really know what it is. So I'm stuck right now trying to figure out what their definition of RSO is, and then also like trying to correct their definition pending their answer to what that is. Um, yeah, it's weird, and it's, I, I don't really know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely weird, and it's, it's kind of scary, honestly, that the regulators, A, don't know more, and B, aren't more responsive with potential issues that could be dangerous to people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems like they're not necessarily willing to prioritize patients the same way they're willing to prioritize the recreation industry. I know Murphy's comment on the industry needs time to mature, you know, that he made this winter was one of the things that sparked me into action too. Um, it seems like that was the breaking point for a lot of people. And especially when the home grow bill hadn't seen any action for two years, but now that we've been 
fighting a little harder against it, we can kind of see why it's in, we're hitting some brick walls, but yeah, working with the CRC on those product definitions and then being able to back it up with safe laboratory testing and safe working conditions for people, eventually we might be able to actually shift this industry a little bit away from like the complete corporate greed that seems to be running it right now. I would, I would hope we would get there soon because it's, it's odd. I don't know. None, none of this industry is what I joined the industry for. And that is a little disheartening. Um, I'm a patient. I joined for patients. I joined to make sure people can get good products. And right now I don't, there's nothing on my shelf that I would smoke. I'll put it that way. Um, we were supposed to have independent cultivators. We finally had one come online. Turns out they were just selling repackaged uh, corporate cultivation product. So that was a, a little disappointing way to start off the independent growers. Oh, Chris, you're muted if you're- Chris, you're muted. Wait, I have not heard the story of independent cultivators selling repackaged corporate products under their own brand. Please tell that story. Wait, um, you haven't, oh, you haven't heard about this yet? The, no. So, there is, so, so far on the New Jersey market, there is one independent cultivator. Who is that? Valley Wellness? Uh, oh, I guess there might be a couple. Okay. There are, there, there are two that I'm aware of. So that's why I wanted to be, okay. So, all right. So, so off the top of my head, the two that are approved for plants in the ground are Prolific Grow House okay. and uh, Garden Greens. Okay. That's interesting. What about Brutes Roots and Valley Wellness? Isn't, oh yeah, true. I guess Brutus isn't is full tilt good for plants too now. And I don't think Valley Wellness has a cultivation site yet. Yeah, I think okay. they're getting it started soon, but or or they have plants in the ground but haven't harvested yet. Brutus Maybe Roots they finally did. got approval. Yeah. Okay, so like, all right, so like, how do you know? Back to what you were saying before. There, there are some independent cultivators. We're not naming names. We're just naming the ones that we know of, right? Yes. But we're not naming names on who this story is about. But, like, how could that happen? They're just literally throwing the weed in their brand name and just throwing it out the door. Yeah, because everyone has the option to purchase wholesale from these big cultivators. And these guys oh need... no 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 they're doing that wow that's yeah awesome. yeah yeah um, they're doing that um, and if a company came forward and said listen we wow. were we were basically bled dry during the licensing process we have no money like we can't wait to you know turn a profit till our plants are in the ground if someone had come forward and said that openly the community might have responded different but the fact that it takes people digging up the coas and looking through the records and you know it's the importance of having access to information to know what you're really getting if you're you know to find out who really grew the medicine and what conditions or to find out what residuals are actually in your medicine and you know what uh, while we're here one thing i meant to ask kristen before while we were talking about lab testing what i see in the underground and the legacy market right now are what i call thousand dollar random number generators people have these little devices on a table that they claim to be an entire cannabis testing lab right they're random number generators right i mean basically it's just spitting out random Those numbers. little devices will actually tell you that they have a plus minus rating of like 10 or 12 percent <laughs> wow <laughs> and so like when you're testing just like just think about that if you're testing something that's 24 percent thc and you throw it in that little machine it could reasonably come back and say it's 36%. But <laughs> also could reasonably come back and say it's 12%. Right. You have oh. absolutely no idea. <laughs> so they're they're Kristen, they're random number generators. We talked about setting up your laboratory. I mean, we could probably put your laboratory in like a semi truck and make it mobile, but like it's it's not your mm -hmm. laboratory, your equipment doesn't is not like the size of a Walkman. No, no. So yeah, some of the technology that some of the um, those readers use, it's just, it's not very accurate. It works better with like higher dose products. Obviously, if there's more to measure, it's easier to measure it. Um, so that's why it kind of works on flower. I would say it's like, maybe like, uh, like Sam said, between five and 12% plus or minus. I mean, it's still not at that level of accuracy that you would get 
through a cannabis lab. I do think that there was one, and I forget, they all have like purple orange names. I, I don't know. It's uh, one of these is actually using liquid chromatography, which hmm. is the concept that you need to use. It's just in a mobile unit. And um, I've seen that be, you know, within a few percentage uh, points uh, versus yeah. versus the other um, uh, type of technology that's very, um, very inaccurate. Um, but so if it's, if it's based on liquid chromatography and if it's actually separating the compounds out, even if it's on a smaller yeah. scale, um, it will be more accurate that way than using some of these other types of technology. Okay. Now, it's not a replacement uh, for the lab. And um, I will say to run like just cannabinoid potency analysis is the cheapest instrument that we have to purchase uh, huh. for that full panel compliance. And, you know, we're not, it's not um, like a pesticide for pesticide analysis, like trace level compounds. Huh. It's that's still... really, I mean, I'm fascinated by the, the cost of the testing and the equipment that's involved. Because again, we do get a lot of the throwback. I hear back on price caps. We talked about this earlier. There's this assumption amongst, I had a legislative aide ask me the other day, he's like, well, Chris, can you really, and actually Ken Wolski pointed this out, you know, can you really compare the Pennsylvania and New Jersey programs? You really can. They're regulated quite similarly. In fact, when you cut, get, as you pointed out, when you cut down to the lab testing, states are doing more rigorous lab testing. So it, in theory, it should be more expensive, but it, it's really not, you know, adding on to the cost. So basically the device to give you the cannabinoid panel that's the cheapest piece of equipment but the the equipment that's required for pesticides and identifying which are pretty that's a big panel of chemicals in there too mm -hmm. that's the more expensive piece of equipment but that's the safety we really want too i mean i kind of i mean the cannabinoid potency is cool for me i'm not a patient i'm a recreational consumer i am more worried if there's pesticides in it though like i definitely want the pesticide testing I'm a little less worried about knowing what my potency levels are, but I want the pesticide testing. So that, that sounds like the more vital equipment there. Yeah. I mean, the difference is between like, um, you know, if you're buying, if you're buying new or good, uh, like an HPLC capable of the cannabinoid analysis might be like 40, $40,000, 45. Wow. Um, the instrument for trace level pesticide analysis is like $450,000. Whoa. Oh, wow. Okay. So like basically, you know, you're talking about a family car versus a Lamborghini here. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a big difference. Yeah, I mean, or like three of my houses. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what about the cost for worry. yeast and mold testing? Hmm. Oh yeah. So uh, yeast and mold testing is actually pretty straightforward um, and it's cheap to do. I mean, you're just kind of growing the yeast and mold and then you're seeing how much grows. Um, so we right. offer that test for $20. Wow. Um, yeah. So if you, so if anybody has concerns, you also don't have to like test for every single thing as a customer, you're allowed to ask for whatever tests that you're willing to pay for. It's the same thing. I know in a previous episode, I'm just going to take a quick sidebar. Someone mentioned not being able to get their own blood work, their own, someone in the comments have mentioned that. And if you go to LabCorp online, and make a patient account, you can order all your own blood work. It's your blood. You should be allowed to know what's in it. Um, it's the same thing where it's your cannabis. Because for all you know, maybe you just, the, the label came off your jar and you want to know which one it is, or you're not sure how long that one's been sitting there and, you know, it made you feel a little funny and now you're sick. So you want to go test if that had mold in it to try and track down why you're sick. You know, the mold, yeast and mold is $20.00. Terps and cannabinoids, if you're strain specific, you know, that's not necessarily the most expensive. It's the heavy pesticides if or the solvents too would fall under that testing, right? Like the pesticides would. Pesticides, megatoxins are the most expensive. Heavy metals is, is, a, is pretty, uh, pretty expensive to run as well. Right. Um, anything on the GC max spec, the solvents, terpenes, um, expanded pesticides, if you want like an expanded panel. It's a little bit more expensive, um, but, you know, we do try to, like, create panels that make sense and that aren't, you know, um, costing, uh, especially for, like, uh, consumer testing, aren't costing you too much, because um, I understand, you know, <laughs> that the what you want to know about uh, the cannabis and what 
what kind of works for you. So, um, so like for example, like testing for um, like the types of mold that may cause mycotoxins will be cheaper than testing for the mycotoxins themselves and things like that. Um, we run the mycotoxins with our pesticide panel. But, uh, you know, we could always uh, come up with different panels uh, depending on the needs, for sure. Um, so, no, I'm sorry. I, I think I lost my train of thought. I, I yeah. <laughs> well, so you talked about being third part, doing third party testing and stuff before cannabis. Is that all paid for by consumers outright or is that subsidized with government programs? Like, how does that, how do, other testing methods become accessible. So if like I go to Home Depot and I pick up the thing and I do the water sample test or the soil sample test, some of that's paid for by New Jersey. Some of it's paid for by me. Some of it's paid for by Home Depot. Like, how does that work? Yeah. So that's a, that's a great question. And that's actually what I was going to comment on, but we did do like something like called it like homeowners <laughs> because yeah. homeowners like to test for asbestos. Right. So if an individual came in um, asking um, and they had like a piece of siding or whatever that they wanted to test for asbestos, we would do that for them uh, directly with that consumer. In Home Depot, you can go and you can get a kit for asbestos testing. And what that kit is, is a box that you mail to a lab, like the lab that yeah. I previously ran. So um, yes, yeah, certainly a percentage of that goes to Home Depot and then um, to the lab. Now for um, other types of like, uh, projects uh, like asbestos abatement in, in uh, public schools, like that's all government funded and that's who funds those projects. So as a laboratory working in asbestos, uh, what we would do is like uh, the consultant and um, the, the person on the site that would remediate the asbestos um, would sometimes be also the person sampling for the asbestos or there would be a separate company that would come in. It depends on the, the state regulations. Um, so basically uh, uh, air sampling company uh, would come in and make sure that that area is, um, that there's no airborne asbestos in there by running um, basically forced air through vacuum filters. Uh, those filters are then taken to the laboratory and then um, we would analyze them and make sure that the, if they're, that, the, that there's no asbestos on there. We'd also do OSHA assessments. So if you're uh, a worker um, working in an environment that you know that there's asbestos in there and you wear uh, respirators and everything, you might also be wearing a, a test uh, pack um, so that you know the level of exposure that each individual is uh, is getting um, throughout their, their shift, right? So we would also uh, monitor that where there's known levels of asbestos that we would uh, be detecting uh, for those OSHA assessments. Uh, just so that they could uh, meet the OSHA requirements uh, for that. Um, so yeah, certainly homeowners would submit samples as well. I always, uh, you know, um, if you are uh, trying to submit your own sample for asbestos, uh, just make sure if it's insulation or something, like wet it down uh, before you just rip it off. Um, don't rip off insulation. Uh, don't rip oh, off oh, lighting. Um, hose it down first, please. You don't want that getting in the air. Um, there would be many times I see someone come in with like a huge uh, piece of transite siding, and I'm like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you should not have done that. That's <laughs> rough. Yeah. Well, be careful. So, uh, you know, what I hear is that there could be like a real pathway here, though. Like, what if there are all these universities that have their cannabis programs, Stockton, Rutgers, Rowan, you know? shouldn't they be participating in some of this testing and secret shopper stuff? I mean, they could be great partners here. Um, and if they could subsidize some testing and also, you know, I've really thought that there must be some way to have a publicly accessible testing to make it even more. I mean, I know you're, it's, it's pretty cost effective right now, but if you could get it down to like $5 a test so that you get a full screen, so the you know I could pay five dollars, but your laboratory is getting paid the balance of that through a state contract or something like that. That's where I think we need to go for public safety. I mean, if CRC and you know the Health Department of New Jersey, they fund all kinds of laboratory testing and 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 public health initiatives. It's the same I believe thing as getting your blood tested if it's your medicine or getting you know your blood drawn to test for how much of a pharmaceutical is in it. It's just a different kind of safety testing especially we have insurance bills in the works right now that government would be paying for the dispensary, bud. How about instead of 
using that insurance money to pay for dispensary medications. It can subsidize a patient's testing for at home grown cannabis. You know, maybe there could be a certain or, like an or something like that. Yeah, yeah I like that. I, mean, or, I feel like because I don't shop at a dispensary, so it wouldn't cover my dispensary purchases, mm -hmm. but I do home grow so it could cover my lab testing. That's a good idea. I, I really like that. We had we had talked about having the insurance cover the initial cost of patients uh, or getting a tax rebate for the initial grow setup. So patients are going to spend four or $500 setting up their initial home grow. If they could get that money back through a tax uh, you know, uh, rebate, or if they can get that money back through insurance, that would be even better. But I like this idea here of, of, of home growers getting their testing done through the insurance program rather than taking the subsidy to pay for dispensary products. It's uh, preventative that is a very medicine. interesting idea. It's preventative medicine. Once we can show that to the insurance companies, they might be interested. That's a very interesting idea. And I, I just like the idea of, of, you know, if we're going to make medical access available for home cultivation and we do have these independent labs, I like the idea of being able to involve everybody here in the process so that patients can see everything in the plant. And again, you know, it's it's not about charging nothing, but it's about getting the cost down to the consumer <clears throat> and then having, a, a you know, some sort of grant program for the laboratories on top. You know, we have these grant programs that are going out of EDA to, to spur the cannabis industry. There's got to be some vehicle there to help out the laboratory side of the industry as well, I think. Uh, and I like this idea of, of getting the this idea of using the insurance as a vehicle for that. This is a very cool idea. Yeah, I really like that idea um, to allow consumer access to testing and to, to subsidize it because it's already a lot. I mean, if you're trying to test like an eighth and you have to pay like $60 for it first and then test it, like yeah. you're, you're losing uh, a lot more than just like the test. Um, mm -hmm. Or like, uh, you know, like when we were talking before about the cost of testing in New Jersey, we have to take 223 grams for like a hundred pound batch. I mean, the cost of that 223 grams is way more than the test. Mm -hmm. uh, That's interesting too. That's really interesting to think about. Uh, you know, I, oh man, I almost forgot about this. I have this on my notes. So a guy hit me up on Twitter and I can't reveal who he is, but he is a, he's a registered patient and he's a reporter in New Jersey. And he feels like he's getting burned a lot. Like, so he started weighing He's, when he bought the eighth, he would weigh it, and it weighs mm -hmm. like 2.8 gra grams instead of 3.5. They won't take it back at any of the dispensaries, of course, once he's opened it. And um, he claims that they're telling him that there's like 10% loss while it sits in the jar. How scientific is that? No. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, like, the, thank you. The, I can give it to them maybe a little bit, because if you think about like it should be around 10 to 12 ish percent moisture when it goes in the bag and when it comes yeah. out of the bag it's a dry pile of dust <laughs> Wait, there you know. Know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. why is my weed so dry <laughs> <laughs> why is my medicine drying out in the jar well that's and a great also question i have no idea it's <laughs> not just dry because packaging laws aren't what aren't yeah, designed just, for patients like, or storage they're designed for like child protection and things mm -hmm. like that we still don't have our solvents listed you know they're not designed to protect the medicine against the shelf lives that we have implemented there's no regulations on temperature control with storage as far as i know or light control with storage as far as i know i mean you guys are pretty involved in the industry i don't know what hoops you have to jump through if they're ones i'm missing That's but well, but the dispensary, but you've been on construction sites, Andrea, like, you know, that dry stuff that you put under the sink to like soak up moisture in an area, just get an eighth of dispensary weed, throw it under the sink. I mean, it, it, it's so dry, it soaks up moisture, you know, it's terrible. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. You know, it could be rotten cotton, but fish food version, like a lot of the dispensary, but after the remediations and everything, it's. It's Especially because like that'll that'll help dry it out too, depending on which type of remediation they can use, right? Um, well, if you're blowing ozone in there all over the the bud, it's gonna do something. Yeah, and so and it's, 
smells well, like but the science it doesn't says, smell like weed anymore. It smells like remediation. It's yeah. the strangest thing. I hope Wait, no one who's this. viewing this ever has to smell remediated weed. Because oh. it's just disappointing. Weed should smell like weed. Yeah, that's even like true. even like old stale weed smells better than remediated weed. <laughs> you know when you like smell a candle and it says it's supposed to smell like something and it just smells like like weird chemicals or something yeah. instead, and you're just like, that's well, that's not apple pie. Like it kind of leaves you with that same feeling, and for me, that same kind of headache. But um. well, I think I think that tonight we identified that you know we need consumers need a lot more information, and we should maybe create a cheat sheet for them. You know what I mean, Kristen? You should have a science cheat sheet that it's like. If they tell you to lost 10% of weight in the jar, don't take that as an answer, first of all. Andrew, you should have a cheat sheet for patients to make sure that they know they're looking at the labels correctly. You know, and I think uh, me, Jake and Sam will try and steer them away from the, you know, spending $60 on a quarter ounce of Ascend Shake. I call Ascend Shake Ascend right now. So Ascend <laughs> in my head is Ascend. And that's just how I look. Because every menu has it now. It's just terrible. It's the cheapest thing at every dispensary. It's awful. My menu does not have any shape. But... <laughs> and I'm going to continue shopping with people that don't have menus. That's okay. If your menu doesn't have shake, it probably doesn't have anything cheaper than $45 an eighth. So that's the other problem. That's the other issue. I do not. <laughs> well, that's why it's so important we get this price cap bill going. Yeah. I think it'll work. You know, again, I've talked to a lot of people who work at dispensaries. They do not like selling it for the price that they are. I mean, they yeah. nobody knows better the price problem and and the quality than the bud tenders do. And yeah. they want to be giving people a better deal. I think it's going to be a, a I things I, are starting to come down. Like it's not going to be good, but like things like I, I know for a fact, like working in on the back end in inventory that like prices are starting to come down not enough <laughs> 60 dollars an eighth they've mined that bubble in so many states sam i mean you know, know once they once they can't sell it for 60 dollars an eighth they leave that's what truly did in massachusetts you know well, once the once the price came down they're just like eh, we're yeah, out well now they're here so you know we're there we're the last state that they can do the 60 dollar eighth in so they're gonna try it here until they can do it in idaho yeah, or Virginia. I bet you Virginia is going to be next. Uh, they can't afford it down there. They'd never be able to get away with a market launch like that. I'm serious. <laughs> like they're launched, they only... they launched with home grows, so like there's, yeah, yeah, true, true. So true. Not happening. Yeah, I, I I think that we're in a unique problem here in New Jersey. I do think that the price gap bill is the answer, though. Um, these corporations have been able to do this here the longest too for 13 years. So. I think that they've gotten away with it here the longest. They've got a bit of hubris around keeping it. And I think this price cap bill could be a wake-up call for them. I hope it's a wake-up call for them. I hope and so. I hope it just makes prices go down without even passing it. But let's hope let's pass the bill. Give the regulators some tools. Why not? It's just rough because honestly, like in New York and New Jersey are like the two places where people are still spending the kind of money that we that people spend in the dispensaries here on the black market too. Like, I agree. Five and eighth is expensive. I'm not saying it's not, but people pay that all day long in New York and New Jersey for the right weed. Like for things not that in my have neighborhood. That. I'm telling and, you that nobody pays seventy five dollars an eighth for weed in Willingboro unless they've come here from another country and just got <laughs> off the airplane and are really jonesing for weed. No way. I know. I'm telling you, dude, that, $75 an eighth is not the common around here. It, I haven't seen $75 that, an I guess it's more common in New York. It's more common in the crowds that I that I tend to. I have people from Brooklyn calling me and saying, dude, I was in Hackensack at a dispensary. That shit is expensive. Yeah. When people from Brooklyn tell you shit here is expensive, it's very expensive. <laughs> and I think the key that Sam was getting at, too, was, uh, Sam, you said for the right weed and that that I understand, you know, I'm willing to shell out a little bit of extra if I, you know, if I know the grower, I have the conversation with them, I can kind of like check out their plants, learn about their process, you know, or using live soil, coconut husk, all that kind of stuff. And I once in a blue moon, I'll treat myself. Day, 
I can tell they you that every day. They just gave you a tour of their farm for that $75 exactly. a week. You know what I mean? In New Jersey, <laughs> Come in New York, there are people every day paying between $75 and $100 per week. I cannot afford that. Think about what live yeah. rosin is going to be on the market here. And, oh, my yeah. God. You know, um, there are some live like, rosin. Again, this is everyday one, weed. This is like hype um, weed. Like cookie, like, you know, cookies is really the only stuff that goes for 75. Think about how hype they are. There's a lot of stuff on the black market that has that level of hype and marketing because you don't have to follow the same rules that the states put everyone in. So and that's the same thing, but that's rec market. If we're talking about medical, I don't know a lot of people that are trying no. to charge medical patients no. $75 for an eighth, no matter what it is. If it's no one like person. A medical menu. So look, the right. $75 eighth isn't the problem. I mean, you see a $75 eighth on menus across the country. The problem in New Jersey is that it's the only eighth on the menu <laughs> at some places. Like I know. it's 75 bucks an eighth and that's it. I know. You know, it's I'm rough. telling you when, once cookies offers a fronting service, they're really going to be in the real deal. Okay. Because right now, I no mean, matter we all, how we accept credit cards, what's that? I said, we accept credit cards, so yes, that, it's well, not yeah. great fronting, but it's about as close as you can get legally. No, no, you need Uncle Tony's fronting service. We need to go full circle on this uh, legacy <laughs> thing, man. Uh, once once Cookies offers the uh, 10% fronting service, now we've gone full circle. Now we've gone. <laughs> so, well, guys, I got to get going. I, it's it's yeah. it's been a long night here. I and I I have I have, I this is I have to say that the idea of using. Um, of using insurance to do uh, laboratory testing for home growers in the medical program and getting more laboratory tests out there through colleges, universities, or the CRC. You know, um, this is my big takeaway from the conversation tonight. I, I really, I, I really believe in that um, being something that helps everybody there. I th could see that being a huge game changer too, as far as, you know, union health and welfare kind of stuff. If the insurance companies jump on, then that's now something that we could offer to, you know, not just bud tenders, not just medical patients, but all of our members, you know, and that's a huge game changer. Just so we're clear, the insurance bills in New Jersey are for people who are on New Jersey's family care system, senior gold or VACO. So these are folks in New Jersey that are on you know, essentially the Medicare of New Jersey's programs. Um, but that is a large segment of the port population. And we're talking about 30% of New Jersey residents are in one of those programs. So that opens up access huge. It, it essentially gives uh, low income access to medical marijuana. That's the point. Large insurance companies won't do this. The vehicle here is that we're using the state insurance programs to do this, which is really cool. But having Blue Cross do it, not there yet. <laughs> Got to do the descheduling part for that one. I hope we get descheduling. I also think, honestly, you know, that I I do think that descheduling is look descheduling is definitely an option for this administration. Um, but I also I think it's an that, option. But is it the option they're going to take? That's what makes me nervous. Uh, you know, I you know, I guess you you joined on. We talked about this earlier, but I have to okay. say, Sam, I've, I've been doing this for 25 years. Descheduling mm -hmm. is my annoying expertise of federal law. And I have to say, in order for descheduling to happen, either Congress has to do it or the White House has to do it. Congress has had 54 years. They have done nothing on marijuana scheduling. And in the last two years, the Biden administration has ordered a scheduling review and left the window open for descheduling. So I have to say that we're in a moment for descheduling that we've never had before. More people are aware of the issue. More legislators are saying the word and the White House is engaged in it. So the idea of it being a real thing, it's more real now than it's ever been on the table. And we have a, a White House that is considering rescheduling and descheduling. I, I think it's definitely a possibility. Um, I said earlier, it's the executive action that ends marijuana prohibition. Um, for a White House, that would be a any White House that chooses to do that. That's a big deal. You know, Richard Nixon started the drug war in 1971 unilaterally by declaring it from the White House. And until somebody uses the White House to declare peace, we might be stuck in it. So um, I think that this White House is just as good as any. I think that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they have the possibility. They've strategically placed themselves here right now. Uh, in 2024. So why not? Yeah, they could do it. They could do it. So. 
And the same way that actually one question that I have for you, and I don't know if this was touched on earlier, just real quick before you go. Um, yeah. Was what if we got rescheduling? How do you think that affects state legal markets? Because the way it's been like pitched is that that would squarely put it in the realm of the pharma industry. And in places like New Jersey, they they are <laughs> everywhere and have a lot of money, a lot more money than like, you know, the, we think of these big MSOs as, you know, big money, but they're nothing compared to Sandoz down the street from me and, you know, J&J and New Brunswick right. and, you know, there's there's much bigger money around than. OK, two money. things about that. Now, I hear you on all that and it, it's fair to talk about it. Um, let me address one thing. Even if Big Pharma got into marijuana, they are not into smoked or inhaled products. OK, they would be developing products that were would be anything but whole plant flour or inhaled products. So even if Big Pharma got into the game, they'd also they're not in a rush. They're they've been around. They'll be here. Um, they're not going to look to roll those products out and replace anything in any quick short term. That's not anything I think would ever really happen. OK, to address your separate question is what would happen if we move to schedule three? Nothing. Um, we've okay. built the state regulated cannabis industry to ignore schedule one in the CSA. And tangibly moving marijuana to Schedule 3 would do nothing to the state laws. It would also do nothing to solve the conflict between state and federal law, which is the problem of moving it to Schedule 3. It's, it's maintaining pretty much the status quo. Um, reminder that Schedule 3 drugs are ketamine, anabolic steroids, codeine. Again, dude, like, are you sitting there drinking a codeine ketamine smoothie? Do you hang out at the anabolic steroid cafe? Are you, Are you looking guys around not? at all of the over-the-counter schedule three drug businesses that you shop at every day going, they get awesome 280E tax breaks. They are so great. No, it doesn't happen. And, you know, again, um, the fantasies that have been sold by lawyers um, to a bunch of people who are investing in fantasies of cannabis um, are not really the reality of the scheduling notion. We have built an entire industry to ignore the CSA. Moving from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 will do nothing to tangibly impact those laws. It also won't solve the conflict, won't give any tax breaks, nothing like that. What I did bring up before was the annoying possibility that the DEA could do what New Jersey has done, which is dual schedule, quantum leap. We in New Jersey have marijuana in Schedule 1 today, Sam. But we have regulated cannabis products separately. Right, right, right. The cannabis is legal and marijuana is illegal. And now, wait, 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 wait. wait. Well, now, imagine I'm a scientist, if, though. But, so, but imagine if DEA does the same thing. If imagine if DEA goes, oh, we like the HHS recommendation of Schedule Three, but if we look at the states, you know, even they didn't do that. Look. New Jersey didn't do it. Pennsylvania didn't do it. Delaware didn't do it. They left the devil's lettuce marijuana in schedule one. And we're going to do the same darn thing, but we're going to create a new description for medical cannabis in schedule three at the same time. Imagine if that happened again, it would just make things more complicated. Look, I, I, the takeaway on all this is that the scheduling review has revealed that the CSA doesn't work for marijuana and it's super complicated. And really, the only answer is to deschedule cannabis. And again, back to if this administration will do it. Um, you know, these are two politicians who have a lot of resolve. They like making big decisions. Um, and this is a big decision to make. And they set themselves up to make it two years ago. So we'll see what happens now. I think it'll be interesting to see. And I think descheduling is definitely a more decisive move towards justice, too, and like working towards fixing a lot of the a lot of the expungements and everything we need to do i know it wouldn't do it innately but it if it's still a federally scheduled substance it'd be a little bit harder to argue for just widespread across the board clearing all cannabis convictions um especially if I it's agree. A scheduled substance i don't think that would necessarily be stepping as far towards that clemency that they're trying to talk about lately um 
And I think right. I mean, we can step towards the stop order on home grows as like a decisive step towards justice, even though we don't necessarily have the same kind of details worked out. We can still make steps towards fixing some of the damage of history that's been going on since since Nixon. You know, Nixon can be the guy that started it, but this administration has the opportunity to be the people that took the first decisive step towards ending the drug war. And they can call it by that name, like to actually decriminalize, deschedule cannabis. Let's see if they'll take the action. And I, did, I was wondering, Chris, what's your opinion on if they do deschedule it? Does that automatically um, legalize home cultivation in New Jersey? That is a great question. I like that. Okay. So, so. <clears throat> if cannabis is descheduled, the states have their CSAs. We yeah. have our NJCRC. Interestingly enough, in the cannabis regulations that we passed, we put some sunset clauses in. So, uh, like, the, in a lot of cannabis regulations that have been passed in the ten, last 10 years have anticipated a potential change in federal law. So... A good sunset clause basically says when the federal government deschedules cannabis, so will we as the state. We will also deschedule cannabis. A bad sunset clause like Pennsylvania's medical marijuana law basically says when they deschedule cannabis, they have to rewrite the medical marijuana law. <laughs> That's the sunset clause. I kid you not. Okay. So um, there have been these sunset clauses built in to trip if the federal government changes. But in, in reality, what should happen is that if the White House were to deschedule cannabis, that would compel, and that's a very diplomatic word, it would force Congress to act on a, a series of laws very quickly. And again, it's totally possible. You're seeing this, like we were talking about all the Oprah stuff in New Jersey. When a government is compelled to act, they can act. They can move bills quickly. They can get them through the committees. They can get them drafted. And the action of descheduling by the White House would be that compelling action to make Congress move that fast on that stuff. Would it, it allow home grow in New Jersey? That would be a big question. It would be how our laws sunset it out and what they laid out after that. So in some states it might. In New Jersey, I'm not sure. But now that you've brought up that question, I am going to look up that answer and ask a lawyer about that one. And, um, and I'm going to look at that. Because some states have very poorly construct, uh, constructed associations with federal law, and you might be right in some places on that for sure. That's right. A good so when I was looking into like different um, different industries and figuring out about like home cultivation, how that's managed, I looked into the tobacco industry uh, for like mm. uh, and see like can you grow tobacco in your backyard in New Jersey? Yeah, apparently, apparently you can. Mm -hmm. um, so you can grow tobacco, you can brew beer, you can brew wine. Yeah, but uh, I think the brewing beer is through some other legislation. Tobacco is because yeah. uh, on the federal, it's uh, it's legal, and New Jersey doesn't have anything specifically banning uh, the cultivation of tobacco. So I was thinking, you know, if cannabis were to be descheduled, and there's nothing on the books in New Jersey specifically banning it, you know, that would sort of legalize home grow uh, in my mind. Well, that's see, that's the unfortunate part about the laws that stands with the with the adult use laws, quite frankly, because they have made it a regulatory scheme for the legal production of it. So and, you know, again, I think that it's interesting. I will look up the sunset clause and how that might jibe for for home cultivation outside the program, for sure. Um, but ultimately, what it would do is it would compel the federal government and the states to relook at all those things. And it would kind of force them to do it in a short order. So the descheduling act would would make all that sort of happen. And we would have an opportunity to try and get the laws that we want. There would be a window of opportunity here to really reshape things very quickly. Mm. And again, it's not out of bounds. Remember, when the 1970 Controlled Substances Act was created, it was done very quickly mm -hmm. and badly and poorly. And they baked racist bias right into it. So. Um, I would love to see marijuana descheduled and the whole CSA get taken apart by Congress after that. I mean, that would be the end of the drug war right there. Because yeah. the drug scheduling scheme has been arbitrary from the get-go. I mean, as a scientist, it must drive you crazy. So it's like, yeah. you know, the drug scheduling scheme is not scientific. It's it's pure politics. It's a it's a it's machinations of politics, nothing of science. So 
correct. Yeah. Well, guys, I got I to gotta get rolling yeah. and I really appreciate you know I appreciate this conversation. This has been more than a podcast and I really, the group of you have really inspired a lot of really good ideas. And Andrea, thank you for bringing us all together. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to come out here and actually let me pick your brain for three hours. I know this was a little <laughs> bit longer than you planned on dealing with me tonight, but I appreciate you taking the chance to educate everybody and spend your time spreading the knowledge that you go out and dig up. Is there any contact information you want to share with people if they were looking? Oh yeah. To follow your adventures. Uh, yeah. If you can, you can find me on Instagram. I'm Chris Goldstein 420 on Twitter. Freedom is green. And if you're looking for organizational stuff, I am the regional organizer for normal. That's N O R M L and that's N O R M L.org. And um, we're continuing to fight for consumer rights out here and have been doing it for 54 years. So there you go. <laughs> Well, thank you again for coming tonight, and I hope we'll catch up with you soon. And I know when you look into those sunset laws, I'll definitely be passing along <laughs> whatever updates I have, at least in regards to, regards to New Jersey. So well, thank you all again. It was great seeing you all, and um, thank you all for all your work. And it is most appreciated, and I'll tell you what, we're having an impact out there. So definitely uh, keep up at it because it's working. So thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Have a great night, Chris. I know it is getting a bit late for everybody too on the East Coast here. You know, we're getting closer to 1030. Um, so I don't don't feel bad if any of you gotta hop off at any point. Um I know I know it's been kind of a crazy couple months where it seems like there's always a big rush to try and get to testify at different committee hearings or try and get to CRC meetings or stay up on all the surprise bills that you know, the government keeps feeding us, but it's been, it's been really nice to actually get, start to get like the teams together and start to see people really, really step up and fight for things in New Jersey for the first time in, in a little while. Um, so I just want to say, make sure I take the time to say thank you to each of you and give you the chance to plug any of your own information too, while we're going through contact information that way. I know, Sam, your camera was cutting in and out before, if you want to drop yours, before people yeah. lose it. Sorry about that. No, well, I I'm, I should be good now. My I You still have my webcam. I do still have your webcam, actually. Yes. So I'm using my phone. I have like an app to use as an external web camera. Um, and my phone was on 1% and I forgot about that. So it was just like struggling to stay on before. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Uh, my Instagram is uh, Shramuel, S-H-R-A-M-U-E-L. Um, that should be how you can find me most places, but I mostly just use Instagram. And, um, you're, gonna have, and you're linked in, too, for like... Oh, business, yes. Right? I do have a LinkedIn. Hold on. Let me, uh, let me find that real quick. What you guys smoking tonight? Anything good? Uh, I'm smoking Jersey Juice, Ooh. which is uh, a strain that a local friend of ours bred. It's uh, bred by Funky Specimen and uh, uh, the Kush Zombie. Um, they're two local Jersey growers and breeders. Um, awesome to be able to meet the people that created the strain as well as the people that it, like it's grown by a, another one of my friends down in Philly um who has been at it for like almost as long as I've been alive it's uh it's honestly an honor to like meet and know all of these people um just like the stories that they share and I don't know it's really cool that's the cool part about the community is that we all kind of get to know know one another. We get to, you know, bond over smoking weed. We get to hear each other's expertise. It's, it's cool stuff. Or, yeah. if or sometimes if people are breeding and growing themselves, they have a special like relationship to that strain or that plant, or they really just know the effects inside and out. They can tell the difference in phenotypes by looking at them and smelling them. Um, 
sometimes if they're caretakers, they might be able to give really good recommendations on which medicine actually helps people. And in New Jersey, it seems like in the legal markets, a lot of times we're completely, completely separated from the people who have legitimate hands-on experience. Um, I know Kristen had even said at one point that, you know, no one even in the lab community necessarily has as much of a background with testing for all these, you know, terpenes and everything in cannabis because we haven't been testing for them as long. So, you know, we can only have as much experience as the industries allow. And in legacy, you can find a lot more experience than you can find in, in the legal market right now. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. You know, this plant's been grown a very long time and testing uh, has come in late to the game. I mean, only, you know, testing for terpene started, what, like 10, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, and since then, finding, you know, new compounds in the plant and seeing what contributes to the aroma versus the effects versus the um, the flavors and things like that. It's all very interesting and um, new, uh, definitely new. There's still new discoveries uh, happening. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm quite curious to see where testing goes from here. Um, I, I personally, like, don't look at any like well like i look at tests a lot but that's for more of the things that i'm scared of not for any kind of profile stuff whether it be cannabinoids or terpenes just because i feel like we don't know enough about the plant to say that those things are like definitively doing stuff or even that we're not like missing things completely um yeah I you do pay attention to your lineages though a lot right though yes yes i do that that definitely is so yeah lineages are more helpful for me than tests oh damn my camera got glitchy again um <laughs> yeah and the test can help confirm like especially like the terpenes dominant terpenes and stuff like that well that will be dependent on genetics so i feel like that's um like looking at especially given and I'm not talking about one state in particular, but across the industry, <laughs> laboratory shopping, and you're seeing like 50% THC flower, and that doesn't that doesn't exist. Um, but you know, you don't know what to trust. Um, but I think like just having a general idea of dominant terpenes, like top three terpenes in each um, cultivar, uh, is interesting to for me at least to kind of track and see how it definitely um, is kind of from those. Yeah, it definitely is. But also on the other side of it, like uh just something that i see in my dispensary a lot and it's something that like i've paid more attention to like mostly because of actually because of andrea um honestly uh hey. there's a terpene that's very important <clears throat> sorry very important to her um felandrine and that as she and you have all explained to me is that like it has crossover with limonene and piney and i get a lot of stuff in my dispensary that's tested by other labs that don't run felandrine and mm. they all go we have a lot of stuff in my dispensary that i would not describe as being particularly lemony or piney and i don't know if that's just because it's like it smells like ozone <laughs> but yeah. I, I wouldn't really describe it as smelling like either of those things but they're really common dominant terpenes like they're in a lot of stuff and i'm just like but none of these things are really upper and none of these things are really taste like that or smell like that so what yeah i what? mean there's other there's other compounds within the plant that um i know that there was a recent study on scat scattle Yep. Um, we're like at a very low concentrations so that can contribute a lot to the aroma. It's not really like you're going to get one for one for limonene dominant to the actual aroma of lemons. But like if you were to smell uh, limonene on its own, it would smell like lemons. It's just with the combination of the other compounds and the levels that the other compounds offer the plant that all contributes to aroma, which I think is really interesting. But on the other hand, you know, limonene itself and other terpenes do have medicinal benefits on their own. So even if the aroma isn't coming through, it can uh, help uh, like modulate the actual effects of, of uh, cannabis in general. And some of like terpenes do, I think it was like, myrcene does interact with your CB, CB2 receptors. 
I yeah. believe. So there are certain terpenes that do actually have affinity at different receptors, uh, which is which is interesting um, to see how they interact um, individually and then in uh, combination with other cannabinoids. Yeah. But like on like I still would be curious to see some of those things. Like maybe not all of them. Maybe some of them really do have that limonene and pinene and stuff in it. But I would be curious to see them tested at your lab, knowing that you run a more full terpene panel. Um, and just see if how things come out different. Um well, that's also the point of the secret shopper program is to test the same product across every lab in the state at the same time and be able to compare all the results in a fair way to see if everyone's within the same ranges or to see if there are any outliers or to see, you know, if we start noticing trends, because for all we know, if Felandrine isn't on the panel, it can artificially inflate the numbers of those other two terpenes that it covers the spectrum for. Like if it falls in the same spectrum, yeah, I'm excited for the secret shopper program for that exact reason. I'm really interested to see what the regulated side of the industry, like, is anybody hiding anything? Is everything on the up and up? Are we playing with numbers? And that's why I'm really happy that, Kristen, people like you are involved with this industry and people like all of you guys over at Tricom and everything. You guys are all on the up and up. It's awesome to see. So, yeah, I'm excited for the secret okay. shopper program. <laughs> And I just yeah. noticed Cotton Skateboard said something about beta carophylline being another terp that acts as a cannabinoid. And that's absolutely true. Um, yeah. That can completely change the pharmacokinetics of how the rest of um, the terpenes and the compounds are playing in your system. But I want to give that, throw that back to Kristen, because I know she was about to say something before I hopped in. Oh, no, I, I, I saw that come through too, definitely. Um yeah the different terpenes act differently i mean and um what you said about terpinaline also correlating with the aroma and flavor um is also something i've heard before also heard i mean as you map out also these different like terpene uh combinations you can kind of see different categories which like correlate to the to the actual genetics which i think is interesting just about like getting all that data consolidated too i mean um, I know there's several ongoing projects to do so, but it's still like making sure that you actually have the correct genetics uh, correlated with those um, with the lineage that you think it is, uh, plus the the cannabinoid terpene data and making sure that's accurate too. Um, which is a lot of gray area right now, but it's an interesting, I think, project and to see how that develops. In New Jersey, strains are essentially regulated no more than like actually less than like flavors would be because they're allowed to change the name of what they call the strain therefore implying a different lineage they're so allowed to me, not even just imply they're allowed to straight up change the lineage yeah. yeah so for me that wouldn't without being able to check the terpenes i might not notice that that doesn't make sense for that lineage and the difference in strange is the difference in my medicine working or something making me worse so it's pretty dangerous the lack of consistency and regulation or like knowledgeable people involved in this because they can't imagine why you know flavors would matter when it's a lot more than flavors going on yeah there's They're actually different. like one specific strain it's a uh, girl scout cookies i know this is gonna sound crazy to anyone that actually knows things about genetics but i can't smoke anything that's related to Girl Scout cookies. And these days, especially in like legal production markets, that can be like 80, 90% of the flour on the market. Um, Cause cookies went into cake and it went into gelato and it went into sunset, sunset sherb and it went into runts and biscotti and all these other things. Uh, and so if you go and you just like terpenes like like when i say i don't look at these tests because they don't matter to me it's because like i can look it can be great terpene wise but if it's related to that strain it will ruin my day i can't do it it makes me really depressed um 
and so like when they change lineages that's actually screwing me more than changing you know faking a test or any other weird shit they might do and that's just a concern from a general consumer st standpoint too you know if you're not educated in the plan you don't know your lineages you you are trusting what they're telling you so for them to be able to just do that really is a betrayal of trust for everybody yeah I don't know any self-respecting grower or like home grower or caretaker that would do that either. It's what's confusing me is like we're seeing certain stuff in the legal markets when in the black markets, legacy markets, whatever you want to call it, the unregulated markets. That some of the unregulated markets are more capable of self-regulation than the formal industries like we have higher standards because if you don't have access to the testing to know oh well what's under the limit of what's okay people might be strict and say i'm not going to use it at all in my grow or in my production like or people are pickier about who they work with they don't just blindly assume if it's on a shelf it's safe people rely on their common sense a little bit more and hold each other accountable because they don't want their friends or family getting sick um Versus in New Jersey, if you have a customer, if you have a complaint as a consumer or as a patient, it can be really difficult to actually reach anybody responsible for handling your medicine at any point in the journey or anybody who actually knows the science behind what might have gone wrong with it. Um, I think... There's a lot we don't know, but there's enough we know that we should stop making excuses for blatantly ignoring common sense when it comes to certain testing or certain options that we have to just do things better. You know, this industry isn't set in stone yet. We can still change things and we can still fix things. Absolutely. That's why it's important right now what we're all doing. Would just like... Oh, go ahead, sir. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to go on a rant about us doing um, good work. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, oh, crap. The, I, you, you would think they would just listen to, to patients like they, like they said they would. <laughs> you, you would think that would be the easiest way to, like, get things right. I think pushing for video testimony because they allowed video testimony during COVID for like the legislative stuff, but the CRC allowed video allows video testimony whenever they decide to have a digital meeting. They just don't happen to have any the rest of the year. So why not still allow medical patients or everybody vid video testimony? Not everyone can take off all day from work to be able to drive down the Trenton or not everyone is healthy enough. Not every hospice patient can get out of their gurney and come argue that, you know, the people who need the medicine the most have the least accessibility to have a voice in any of this right now. And it's, they really need to change that. We don't need a new internal podcast. We need a dialogue. We need yeah. safe medicine. <laughs> Not for nothing, but the same resources that set up that internal podcast could have just been used to give everybody, I'm sorry, my dog's like really sniffing around. <laughs> <laughs> but those same resources could have just been used to give people the same digital access they had. You know, there's no reason that in the age of Zoom, Skype, um, StreamYard that we're using, there's no reason that a medical patient who's bedridden can't listen in and comment on the CRC's issues from their bed. It's We have the tools. They just refuse to use them. Yeah, yeah so and I think an, another thing that I've noticed changed since um, they're back in person, they used to have some meetings scheduled in the meeting in the evening to allow for people that work uh, during the day to attend and then be able to speak in the public comment. I remember these meetings going like past 9 p.m. some days. Now that they're in person in Trenton, it's all during the day. It's all early in the day. So, yeah, you would literally have to take off of work and go there and sit there all day to be able to comment uh, publicly. Um, 
or you could submit written comments that, um, but it doesn't have the same impact. People, not everyone watching the meetings will go and look at the uh, written comments like two weeks later, whenever they're posted. And if you do, even if you do register to speak, it's not like you're given a time that you're going to speak. You know, you're pretty much required to be there all day because there's no, no indicator of how long the commission is going to take in private sessions. There's no indicator of how long commentary periods are going to go or how, where you are on the list of people commenting that day. You have, so even if you were trying to sneak over on a lunch break, you don't necessarily have any kind of straight answer, even when you're jumping through the hoops to register ahead of time. You have to register a day or two days before the meeting, depending on the meeting. Why not allow us to submit our three minute video testimony two days before the meeting? Or why not host the live testimony the way we do for digital meetings or during COVID? You know, we have these options, but we could do a f we could do the meeting in the morning and host a secondary comment period at night digitally if they used to do nighttime meetings you know let them yeah. host it in trenton during the day and then have a follow up secondary comment period at night digitally a million solutions that they choose to ignore and it's i don't want to say they're purposely excluding certain groups but that that's almost what it feels like so like I, I've been trying for weeks now just to get their definition of RSO. Uh, it took two over two weeks to finally get a single person from the CRC to call me back. And I sent him an email to say like, hey, like, I got your voicemail. I will forward you the product information. But like, first, I need to understand what you guys think RSO is. Because if you investigate this, and you don't take it off the shelf, then you're leaving a dangerous product on the shelf. And he said, no, give me the product information. He said, no. Yeah. He well, said, if you don't give me the product information, this will not proceed any further. Were you I just need an, like, I, had, I never wanted to file a complaint about a product. All I wanted was a definition of a word and they won't give it to me. I know they don't have one, Kristen, but... Um, <laughs> and uh, it might that's be easier what I'm getting, to, get to get them to acknowledge is that they don't have one because it's important that they have a definition for that even word if, separate from the other concentrates. Even if they don't get a specific definition for each concentrate, because that is asking them to learn a lot, you know, <laughs> like this done quickly. <laughs> if we can at least get them to list the extraction method or the solvents specifically on the actual products on the packaging, list your extraction CPA method, list your solvent, and then make the COAs available online. Every product in metric, the COA should be available to consumers online. I shouldn't have to go out to the dispensaries to find out that they don't have anything safe for me there. So then go try it the next one and have to wait and pull the COAs and get them printed one by one by the people at the dispensary. You know, there's so many accessibility show. options and I appreciate them trying with digital cards, but we need digital testimony. We need digital COAs more than we need digital med cards. There used to be digital COAs. They stopped doing it. And the CBA called for uh, the extraction methods on testing labels two weeks ago. And I just don't think the CRC has done anything about it. That's so like they true. won't listen to patients. They're not responding to anybody. They do so don't take to it personal if you're trying. Without patients. Um, yeah, so it's, there wouldn't be any medical program, there wouldn't be any cannabis program anywhere legally in this country if it wasn't for medical patients. So to make the programs not suitable for them, or to be excluding specifically like hospice patients who were the first ones granted medical access anywhere, who were the ones treated like guinea pigs because they were willing to die to prove what they believed in they're still the ones who can't get access to their medicine right now. They have to pick between healthcare or not. And they don't even have a way to really have a voice in this besides written testimony. And I know last time I publicly testified at the CRC was digitally and the CRC never responded to me for months now, but members of the industry who actually heard me speak out did. And nice. I think, 
everybody should have that opportunity to quite literally have their voice heard if they want it heard. Point of public meetings is to be public, not part of a book of notes later. Written testimonies would help though. So anybody who wants to is absolute, especially, I think you have to be from New Jersey for this one. But if you're interested in submitting written testimony to the CRC, you can do so Wednesday or Thursday. I wonder, um, I kind of like had an idea if we had a bunch of people sign up to the public meeting, would someone be able to like bring a phone and have them on FaceTime and then like just put them up there and just be like, see how easy this is to just like allow people to call in. <laughs> That's um, actually a really good idea. I can try to set that up for Wednesday if certain people I know can't make it because I know some patients right now that definitely have an opinion on this stuff that can't can't make it there. I couldn't make it to the last public meeting. So, you know, if anybody wants to literally say something and can't reach out directly and we'll try to get your voice heard at the meeting because it is that simple. It's yeah, really it really If they can pull up the PowerPoints and the timer, they can pull up a testimony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the timer. <laughs> no, you're they, right. You're they right. Don't, the timer doesn't work most of the time, though. So. <laughs> True. <laughs> they do mess that up a lot. Well, if the video <laughs> submissions were capped at three minutes, like our testimony is, they wouldn't even need to run the timer at the same time. Oh, yeah. it might help. Really? It might up. Oh, we're streamlining here. Mm -hmm. Oh no, don't streamline. We can't, can't streamline the government affairs. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I have to get going too, actually. It's starting to get a little late it, for me. Um, it is. I wanted to thank you guys for including me, though, and including the union. You know, it's it's much appreciated on our end. And anything you guys need, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're, you know, we're there for all you guys. And thank you for both coming on here tonight, but also getting involved and stepping up. And I know I've I've seen your face around plenty before I knew who you were because I know you're an active member in the community. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come out here. I appreciate the union taking the time to back home grow and to, you know, look into the testing batch situation and Absolutely. be able to speak up for common sense public safety. So I don't know if you wanted to mention again, anywhere that people can contact you directly or your website for the union, if you have any initiatives going on at the moment. Yeah, I mean, we have all kinds of crazy initiatives going on, but um, <laughs> if you want to follow us on Instagram, it's UFCW360. And it, it's like a, like a federal fucking, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I can curse. It's like a federal <laughs> logo looking kind of thing but if if you see that you're looking at the right page i swear we're not cops <laughs> um and if you want you're more than welcome to uh put my phone number up on the screen too that's my work number if there's any workers you know listening and you have an issue at your workplace you know we're here for you you're more than welcome to reach out and we look forward to just working together you know, we want to see the cannabis industry succeed and thrive, too. We want to see it done right. We're all smokers in the cannabis division, you know, from hash rosin to just plain old little joints. But we want to see it succeed and we want to see it succeed safely, correctly. And as long as the workers don't get left behind, that's all we really ask. So thank you guys for being an active part of it. Thank you guys for, you know, safety testing. Sam, thank you for being an activist and a dispensary runner. You know, Andrea, you're out there all the time, too. I Just like me, I knew your face, but I didn't know who you were, but I know what you were doing. So <laughs> thank all of you guys. Seriously. Well, we definitely appreciate it. And I think we all are probably going to wrap up for tonight, too. It's probably not just going to be you signing off because it's getting a little wait closer to 11 here on the east coast so yeah i need to eat something have a great night. <laughs> yeah i did just want to say um njhomegrow.homegrow.com for everyone in the chat um to please uh go to there and send emails uh even if you don't live in new jersey you can still email our representatives um i don't think they're checking yeah, it, you can definitely send the emails from out of New Jersey. And if you want to customize your own email from out of New Jersey, that's more than welcome too. Because from New Jersey, we can't vouch that home grow saves lives. Maybe you moved out of New Jersey and you're like, I had to because I didn't have access to medicine. 
if you guys want to talk about the RSO or the rosin or things that aren't accessible or affordable in New Jersey right now, you can speak up. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. Let's show them that people actually care about the patients here, even if the legislators don't. Um, and thank you again to Kristen for putting that website together for njhomegrow.com, trying to give us a place to organize a little bit of the madness, collect some of the articles and updates and options that we have going on. I definitely want to make sure you mention your lab's website too, or like your lab's contact information, not just the home grow stuff. Yeah, trichomeanalytical.com or um, I believe our Instagram is trichomeanalytical. You should be able to find us. Um, but yeah, first priority, njhomegrow.com and send those emails. Uh, I also did want to uh, mention, because we did uh, mention it briefly earlier on the call, um, the 418 uh, Day of Unity in Washington, D.C. for descheduling. Um, so that's being organized by the Last Prisoner Project, which is lastprisonerproject.org. They're also Last Prisoner Project on social media. And um, if you're in the area, or if you can be in the area, you should go to DC on 418. I will be there. I'll be there too. As long as my health holds up to get me there, I'll be there. <laughs> as long as my wallet holds up, I'll be there. We will blindfold you, Andrea, and I will get you there. <laughs> See? <laughs> there's always a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and as bad as that sounds, that's the solution for being photosensitive and traveling in a car when there's too <laughs> Yes, as, as odd as that sounds. Yeah. Yeah. bag over your head. You'll notice I usually wear the beanies that fold up because then I can fold it down like a shield when I need to. <laughs> or sunglasses indoors. The CRC meeting, you'll probably see me with sunglasses indoors but do what you got to do. Well, yeah. yeah, anybody who wants to meet up in DC, that's next month on the 18th. If you want to meet up in Trenton, we have a hot box for home grow coming up this month on the 28th. The CRC meeting is this Wednesday, the 13th. So there's plenty of options coming up to get involved or, you know, if you want to come out and meet us, you're always welcome, but at least send your emails. It doesn't matter where you are. And if you want to get in touch with me personally, you can find me on Instagram at Tanji Tulpa. It's going to be right below my name over here. And thanks everybody for tuning in and watching and everybody for coming on. You know, this really felt pretty hopeless a few months ago. And now it seems like we're, we're starting to cover a little bit of ground. We're starting to dig our heels in, starting to, you know, find our teeth, find our voice. And I'm excited to see who else, who else joins in and what else we can do in a few months from now. All so. we have to do is out organize the politicians and we have that power. That's actually kind of a, kind of a good point because if you know anything about New Jersey, it's also not well. <laughs> yep. Um, that is a great point. And anybody who wants to follow along with Andrea Ask, don't forget to like and subscribe or check out some of the other live shows that are going to be up this week on FCP. Thank you. Big thank you to Future Cannabis Panel, Future Cannabis Project for letting us have this little panel here tonight. And you know, thanks everybody for caring. Keep smoking, keep sharing, keep fighting. I know things are a mess everywhere, but we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. One one step at a time. So.